There's a subset of men who move among women with ease. These rare men are those who have acquired, who have consciously learned the ability to see women in their natural state, who can see right through their makeup, their walls, their insecurities, and their loss. They see women as they really are. Women can sense immediately when they are in the presence of a man who likes women, who thinks they are beautiful, who makes them feel lovely, who delights in them. He genuinely likes women, and men that like women are liked by women. So, women open themselves up to him willingly. This is because he understands the things that women universally respond to. He is not like other men, and women know it. So who are these men, allowed to roam unhindered in the land of women? And what qualities do they possess that compel women to allow them liberties not afforded to other men? These are the men we call naturals, natural seducers, a natural facility with women, a man who is comfortable in the land of women. Now there have been times uh, at speaking engagements uh, where I've been introduced as an example of a true natural. Zan, my friend Zan, is a natural. And as I'm walking up to the stage, I'm scratching my head and I'm thinking, is that really true? Am I really a, a natural? Is that really what I am? Am I a true natural? Well, let's run down the usual checklist, shall we, and find out. Do I believe in women? Yes, I do. Am I comfortable around women? I am. Do I flirt with women? Of course. All ages, shapes, and sizes. Have I, have I dated beautiful women? Yes, I have. Have I had great relationships with wonderful women? The best. What about this question? Uh, have I slept with a lot of women? More than most, I suppose. Have I had three sums? Or more sums, more than three? Hmm. So am I a natural? Does that make me a natural? Well, how about this question? Can I extract a phone number from a girl in a club or a party? Well, yeah, I can. Can I perhaps extract the entire girl from the club or the party? Forget the phone number. Yeah, I suppose I can. But there are other guys that are better at doing that than me. Like I always say, I am not a pickup artist. That's not what interests me. How about this question? Can I take your woman away from you? Eh, probably not. After all, you're most likely a good husband or, or boyfriend. She loves you. She wouldn't leave you for me. But can I convince her to have a secret affair with me? Well, no, that's a different question. I wouldn't, of course. That's not the way I do things. But yeah, I probably could. You see, I am a lover of beauty. Beauty in all its forms, art in all its forms. And that attitude will make you automatically more magnetic to women. Tactics and techniques will allow you to take a girl home from a club or a party. It will teach you that. But what I'm talking about is so much deeper. Because given an hour with a very same girl, your delight in her will create a kind of poetry for her, a connection. So here is the part that really interests me as opposed to picking up a girl. What interests me is the notion of creating chemistry and amplifying attraction. You know, the, the first time you spend time with her over coffee or a glass of wine. So maybe I'm the, the best at convincing a girl to leave the club with me, but give me an hour with that very same girl, and I can pretty much guarantee that she will remember me for the rest of her life. So does that make me a natural? Let's see, do I believe that I can seduce any given woman in any room? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Now, am I always successful in seducing any given woman in the room? No. And that is a very, very important point for you to remember. You see, my ability and my belief in my ability to seduce women is not necessarily related to my actual success in seducing women. But I'll tell you this. That attitude will take you very far. It is endearing to women, and there is no harm in it. Believe me, it will open 
far more doors for you than it closes. It's refreshing to women to hear that. I simply decided one day long ago that every woman that talks to me or interacts with me at all is interested in me. It's not always true, of course, but it is a very fun and empowering way to conduct your life. So was I born a natural? Was I born naturally good with women? No. And I'll tell you why. It's because the first secret of naturals is this. They're not born with it. Every man throughout history who was good with women was good because he chose to be. At one point in his life, tired of rejection, he decided to consciously get that part of his life handled. He made a choice. And so he began to interact with women. He began to listen to women. He tried and failed. And he retained the things that worked and discarded the things that didn't. In other words, he invented himself. So there's nothing I say or do that you can't say or do. It's all just a choice. Naturals are not born, they're made. Now I've been interested in this for a very long time. Why is it that some men, and women really, seem to have an, an aura, a presence, a way of drawing others into their reality? Can it be broken down and described? Can it be taught? Can it be learned? You know, if you, if you have a friend who is a natural, or had a friend in college, for instance, who is good at the women, and you happen to ask him about his prowess with women, he probably looked at you kind of blankly and, and said something like, I don't know, just be yourself. Well, we know that doesn't work. You see, the thing about men who are naturals, who are good with women, is that they have a very hard time describing exactly what it is they do or say. It just comes, well, naturally. Now, the first thing someone will shout out is that these guys are that way because they have a lot of self-confidence. Well, this is correct, but it isn't all. There's something more, something more than self-confidence. It's an, an inner clarity, an understanding, a centeredness, a purpose. Well, I can only speak from my own experience and what has rung true to me all these years. And I have identified 10 traits common to all natural seducers, 10 traits. Every man in history who was good with women had all of these traits, all of them, 10 traits. There may be more, but these are the ones I have identified. And as I reflected on this, it dawned on me that I don't think it has ever really been described before, these traits. But I really truly believe this is the essence of what we are trying to capture. And bear in mind, this is all very hard to describe. These are a, very, a set of very powerful and yet rarely understood concepts. Very subtle. And there is some overlap. But let's take a look at these 10 traits and see if we can't catch a glimpse into the mindset of a natural. Trait number one. To a natural seducer, they are all his girls. Every woman is his woman. He has immense compassion for women. He sees their sadness and their loss, their faded dreams, their dead and dying relationships, their stultifying careers and responsibilities, and he makes it his mission to impart beauty to her life again. And he does this with every woman, including the 60-year-old waitress who is serving him eggs for breakfast. They are all his girls. He makes that waitress shine. He makes her feel pretty. He makes her feel alive and inspired once again. It's because he believes that women deserve passion and he knows they are not getting it from the men they are involved with. So it is his mission to correct this imbalance. This is the first trait. A natural seducer has compassion for women. All women. Remember, they're all his girls. It is his mission in life to make them feel alive and pretty again. And he does it. To illustrate that, I'll tell you a story of a time I was at a party. And it was a really fancy party. There's a lot of people there in a nice big house. And uh, a lot of pretty girls there. And I remember I was sitting on the, on, the, on the arm of a couch. And there was three girls sitting on the couch. Pretty maidens all in a row. 
And the one I liked was the one in the middle. But I was talking initially to the one on closest to me on this end and uh, eventually going to start to turn my conversation to the one in the middle. So I'm sitting on the end of this couch talking to this girl and, we're, and she's, she was a, a fun girl and, and we're having a great conversation. She was pretty and lively and it was, it was excellent. We're laughing and joking and a guy came up to me through the crowd, an acquaintance of mine, a guy that kind of knew, knew me and I kind of know him and he walked up to me and I said, hi, how you doing? And he leaned down to me and he whispered in a stage whisper, a loud whisper, what are you doing, Zan? I've never seen you pick up a fat chick before. And he trundled off through the crowd. I looked down at this, this wonderful, beautiful girl that I was been talking to and I saw her face fall. And it broke my heart. I saw her sadness and and uh, I couldn't believe that he would say that. And, and, and he was already gone. I grabbed her by the hand and I said, come with me. I picked her up out of the couch, put my arm in hers like this. And I spent the rest of the entire evening at the party with that girl. I ignored the other girl I was trying to see. I ignored all the girls there. I made her feel like she was the most beautiful girl there. We were the life of the party. We were telling jokes and wandering around, introducing ourselves to everybody. She was my girl for that night. That's what I'm saying when I say a natural seducer has compassion for women. They are all his girls. He takes care of them all. That's what I mean. You know, Shakespeare wrote, she's beautiful and therefore to be wooed. She is a woman and therefore to be won. This is what he believes. He knows that most women are not really 100% single. Every woman that is even remotely pleasant to be around has a guy of some stripe somewhere. She either has a husband or a fiance or a boyfriend or a guy she is seeing or a guy she is kind of dating or a guy she is sleeping with or a guy who likes her and she tolerates or a guy she can call. You know, to wait for a woman to be completely single is to wait a long time. True, she might be newly single, but that is a very narrow window. Most women will get involved on some level with someone very soon. And the enlightened seducer recognizes this and gives it no further thought. They are all his women. They are all his girls. It is his mission to make women feel beautiful again. It doesn't mean that he is going to steal her away from the guy she is with. It just means that in his presence, she feels like a woman. He shares the secret of women. They love men. They desire them. They desire sex as intimately and directly as any man, yet sometimes they must disguise it. This is because of society, friends, family, her career. She must hide it. He realizes that a woman is complicit in her own seduction. She desires it. It's a very powerful frame of mind because when you believe that, they start to believe it too. When you consider it like this, that they're all your girls, there is no such thing as picking a girl up. She's already picked up. She's already your girl. You respect that she's in a relationship, but she's still your girl. You have respect for her. Okay, trait number two. Every true lover knows that the secret to his power over women lies in the power they have over him. Wow, that goes against everything that we've been taught. I'm the prize. She's just another girl. She has no power over me, right? Right. In theory, that is correct. But in practice, the notion of being unable to control your desires around her can be very seductive. Every seducer from Casanova to George Clooney recognized the power of showing a little vulnerability to a woman, and they used it very consciously. He comes across as being delighted by women. That's the way he is. And truly, he is delighted by women. He is delighted by the way they flow through life and the way they occupy this world. Their essence enamors and enchants him. And in return, he can't help but celebrate them. That's the key. He can't help it. He lets it be known that he's delighted by her. He genuinely likes women and men that like women are liked by women. The trick is not to overcompensate, to be too vulnerable. You don't want to come across as inept or pathetically needy. Just occasional flashes of vulnerability or non-smoothness 
in her presence. This is because men who exhibit no weakness to a woman can sometimes be intimidating to her. She might reject you to prove a point and to bring you down to a level of humanness again. She feels intimidated and vulnerable sometimes. And she mistrusts a man who doesn't sometimes display a human side as well. So you may have massive experience with women. You might know exactly what to do or say in every situation. You still can't come across as too smooth, too rehearsed. Instead, naturals occasionally display a little weakness. You know, uh, Cary Grant, when asked the secret of his success with women, he replied, I tell them I can't get it up. The enlightened seducer enters into every one of his romantic adventures with newness and excitement, like it is his first love all over again. He knows that the impact he makes on her and that she makes on him will resonate with both of them for years. And will he be hurt? Will he feel the pangs of loss when it ends? Of course. But he loves it all just the same. He portrays an intense need for her, but he is not needy. There is not the slightest hint of neediness about him. Note the, note the distinction. He needs her, but he's not needy. Yes, he puts her on a pedestal, but it, it is a pedestal of his own choosing. That is the way I conduct my life and my actions. Remember, this is consciously done. I am completely unrestra unrestrained with women and having enormous fun. I am a slave to my love to women, and they can sense it. The weakness of women is language and words. Fortunately, that is the skill that can be strengthened. And I never ever worry about a woman's resistance to me. If she says she is not interested and leaves, I understand. But whenever, she's, whenever I see her again, I immediately go up to her, smile and wink and pick up right where I left off, just like I had never, she had never resisted me in the first place, because that would have been unthinkable. In other words, her boyfriend objections or whatever mean nothing to me, they're just words. Anybody that knows me very well knows that I usually don't play hard to get. I tell a girl right away that I like her. I directly state my desires to her. The key is to smile and wink and say it in a way that conveys desire, but gives her the impression that if she turns your offer down, you're not going to worry about it for even two seconds. She knows that you'll simply walk away. And inevitably, as you pursue this theme further with her, you will be asked why you were attracted to her. A normal guy would say something like, oh, you have a beautiful smile, that's why I like you, or whatever, this is what I do instead. She'll say, um, she'll be talking to me, she'll say, yeah, I'm an accountant over at, uh, at which point I interrupt her and cut her off because I love cutting girls off in mid-sentence. And I'll say, uh, she's telling me she's an accountant, and I'll say, listen, you're kind of cute. I'm starting to like you. I want to see you again. And she's like taken aback, and she'll say, uh, are you always this direct? Why are you so interested in me? I'm like, hmm, I have no idea. I'm stumped. That's exactly what I'm trying to figure out. I don't know what it is about you, but I'm trying to figure that out. That's the kind of thing I say to a girl. Trade number three, he has a purpose in life that isn't her. It doesn't mean he doesn't focus on her or delight in her, but he's going on an adventure through the jungle to see what magic he can find. And he would love it if she came along, but if she doesn't, that's okay. He's sad and he'll miss her because she's cute and she should come, but he's going anyway. You see, the reason women are so enamored by so-called jerks is because they like the fact that he has drama in his life that isn't her. He is too caught up in himself to spend much attention on her and so she gets busy trying to correct it. Now the mistake most men make is that they get a girlfriend and then they make her the adventure. She becomes the sole purpose and meaning of his life and his hope for the future. They stop what they are doing and focus only on her. And women don't want that. They don't want to be the adventure. They want to go on an adventure. They want you to take them on an adventure. They want to be caught up in something exciting, something larger than themselves. Something that allows them to escape their banal existence. But understand this, guys. My attitude and my whole approach to a girl is along the lines of, you know, you're kind of hot. I think you'd make a good girlfriend for me. I may not be the one you're with forever, 
but I will be the one you always remember. I'll take you on an adventure, girl. I'm going anyway, and I'd love you to come, because you're cute. But if you'd rather not, I understand. Just remember you'll always have a fan out there, me. The key here is there are two ways you can approach a woman. One, with self-confidence, or two, with smug assumption. You can never let number one degrade into number two. You know what I mean, the whole, whatever, your loss, lots of women out there, I'm the prize. Yes, it's true, it is her loss, because you're a nice guy. But it's my loss too, I liked you. I had all these plans, I was gonna take you everywhere, show you off to all my friends, make you wear tight little skirts. It was great, I had it all figured out. It's your loss too, but you gotta go anyway. Trade number four, he realizes that honesty is the greatest aphrodisiac. His biggest fear is to be perceived as just another man. He is not like other men, nor does he aspire to be. If he thought for a moment that she regretted her encounter with him in any way, or somehow felt sad or hurt because of him, it would break his heart. He can't bear the thought that a woman would ever feel she was manipulated by him. And yet, he doesn't mask his desires as a man. He never portrays indifference or apathy in an attempt to sneak under the wire. Instead, he embraces his sexuality, presents it to her without presumption. He is delighted if she responds favorably, because she's cute, but deeply respectful if she does not. He would never lie to a girl to get her into bed, never. If a woman opens herself up to him physically and emotionally, he doesn't take that lightly. He has a lot of respect for that. He knows he can do a lot of damage by being dishonest in his intentions or about the future. You can hurt her heart, and she trusts you not to. You can take advantage of her vulnerability, yes, and get yours, because you are a pickup artist, but you will hurt her heart and sadden her a little more. You will color all her future interactions with men. It's, it's, kind, of like, it's kind of like peeing in the pool. Everyone has to swim in it. A recurring event in my life is a woman saying this to me. I can't believe I just told you that. I just met you. I've never told that to anyone before. This is because she knows I would never take advantage of her in any way, never betray her confidentiality, never use it to manipulate her in any way. She's comfortable around me. Or I've heard this a lot too. I can't believe I just slept with you on the first night I met you. I'll ask, why did you? I don't know. You were just different. This is a recurring theme in my life. Somehow, she absolutely understands that I will respect her in the morning, and that I have a very high regard for her, and that I'm interested in experiencing all the delight she has to offer as a young, vibrant, sensual woman, and it's not just about sex. Everything about her is delicious. I convey that to her, and she picks up on it. I'm different than other men. In my experience, this honest, unthreatening, direct approach, women will open right up. The whole notion of waiting a while before you get intimate with her at this point becomes moot. I never feel it went too fast, and strangely enough, neither does she. She's comfortable enough to open herself up to me. Honesty is the greatest aphrodisiac. A woman knows in five minutes what I'm all about. She knows she can't put me into that category of, let's just be friends. She doesn't even try. This is because I am honest and I let her know my intentions immediately. How do you let a girl know that you are honest? I tell her right away. I tell her I'm not like other men. She will believe you if you are sincere and say it with enough authority. I tell her this, I say, listen, what you need to know about me is that I am very honest. I don't know what the future holds, but I know I like you, you're my type. And you realize if you hang around with me, you and I are going to get together, F feel that. I might not be the one you were with for the rest of your life, but I will be the one you remember. You know, I talk about how honesty is the most important thing you can learn in your dealings with women. It's true, it is. It truly is the number one aphrodisiac, honesty. Having said that, I lie all the time. More correctly, it is important to get caught telling lies all the time. 
I just let the girl catch me in the lie and smile and wink at her. In fact, I always say things in such a way that the girl is never really sure if I'm telling the truth or not. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. A girl says to me, what sign are you? Me? I would say, guess. She'd say, uh, Libra or whatever. What? That's amazing. How did you guess that? I am a Libra. Really? I got it right? So when's your birthday? And I will say something like, uh, December. You lied. You aren't a Libra. I'm not. Smile and wink at her. I'm not. What? She'll say, no, I knew you were lying. She's pretending to be offended. And I'm like, hmm, well, I'll tell you what then. Come give me a kiss and I'll forgive you. Smile and wink. And she'll say, but you were the one that lied. Yeah, but you're right. Buy me a drink and we'll call it even. That's the kind of banter you want to get going. You want to get her to the point where she's pretending to be offended. But then you're in. She catches you in white lies. You're honest, but you kind of tell lies. Here's a real life example uh, from a while ago at a very crowded nightclub. I was trying to make my way to the bar to order a drink and it was really busy. And I was just about there when a girl tapped me on the shoulder. I turned around and she was hot. And not only was she hot, but she was there with some very pretty girlfriends as well. There's three of them all together. I'm like, well, hello. So she smiles sweetly at me and says, hey, I think you should let me and my friends go ahead of you today because today is my birthday. And I smiled even more sweetly and said, really? Well, that's weird because today is my birthday too. Really? No, I don't believe you. What's your sign? And I'm like, hmm, let's see, Gemini, Capricorn, Leo, Scorpio. She pretends to be offended at my lie and she says, I knew it. It's not your birthday. Me pretending to be sorry. All right, you caught me. I am lying. It's not my birthday. So she's laughing and she says, well, I guess that's okay. It's not my birthday today either. It's really tomorrow, but we're celebrating today. So now you have to let us go ahead of you to the bar. And I'm like, I don't think so. You lied to me about your birthday. But so did you. Yes, but you lied first. Then I turned around and ordered my drink. And as I was walking away, I said, see a birthday girl. It's fun. And I didn't give in to what guys would normally do. Okay, go ahead of me. Just this one time though, they're trying to still be cool. Now I'll just let you through this one time, but I would never normally do that. I don't do that. And because I didn't give in, those girls followed me around all night. So be very honest, but get caught telling lies, if you know what I mean. Trait number five, he never kisses and tells, ever. He feels no need to validate himself to other men by bragging about his exploits. He never kisses and tells. His encounters with women are never about bolstering his own self-esteem or adding another notch to his bedpost. It is all about respect. This is because he is not interested in taking something but always in sharing something with her. For he knows that all experiences in life are amplified once they are shared. If she doesn't feel like a queen, he doesn't feel like a king. So he's never out to get laid. That isn't the goal. His only desire is to share, to interact with a beautiful woman. He believes that if a woman trusts him enough to open herself up to him physically and emotionally, it is a profound thing. Having said that, if she tells other people, it is actually very good. He has nothing to hide. He is not ashamed of his love for women. Understand what I'm saying when I say he never kisses and tells. It's important. Understand the principle behind it. Not that you care that people that hear about it. Why does a natural never go around telling people that she slept with him? Respect. That's why respect for her. You see, a man can sleep with lots of women and he's a stud. If a woman does the same, she's a slut. Unfair double standards to be sure. It's the way it is. So out of respect for her and her reputation, he never kisses and tells. You know, a lot of guys will go on a date with a girl, get a, a kiss on the cheek goodnight, and then brag to, to their buddies, high five. Yeah, she was all over me. I lie the other way. My friends ask me how it went with the girl the night before. I always just say, it was really nice. I, I really like her. She's a cool girl. She's a really nice girl. In fact, my friends know not to even bother to ask me anymore. So how do you let her know that you never kiss and tell? I tell her. 
<laughs> one of the things I tell right away, I'm very discreet. Let her do it. In fact, if a woman says to me, wow, that was amazing, I always laugh and say, don't tell, don't tell me, tell all your friends. What is the biggest reason a girl will give you any last minute resistance of sleeping with you? You know, you know that feeling, we've all been there. We've all heard the cliched phrase, and this is why. You won't respect me in the morning. Think about that. Think about what she is saying. That fear looms large on the horizon of most women. She is so afraid that you're going to convince her to have sex with you, then depart hastily right then or in the morning, and the next day go around and brag to all your buddies how cool you are and how easy she was. She's afraid of that. That is a very big concern for women. Think how devastated a nice girl will feel. They have to worry about, peer, uh, about appearing too easy and about the reputation. You don't have to. Well, I have this notion, and you can bet that all natural seducers throughout history have this notion as well, or have had this notion. And I believe it is a rarity in most men. The notion is this, a woman that sleeps with me, a woman that trusts me, 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 enough to open her body, her emotions, and her heart to me. Well, that is a very profound thing. That is something that can never be taken lightly. You have to hold her and her emotions very carefully in your hands. Your goal should always be to leave her better than you found her. That, my friends, is true respect. And a woman that senses this from you will open herself up to you in ways you never dreamed. The whole concept of last minute resistance goes right out the window. No such thing. See, she already likes you. She wants to be intimate with you. She wants it very much. But she needs to feel that you respect her. And a true seducer knows the secret of women. It is this. If she knew, if she really believed that no one would ever find out, not her friends, not her family, not her co-workers, she will open herself up to you in amazing ways. That's why these guys never kiss and tell. This is why women will artificially and arbitrarily put a time limit on how soon they will sleep with you. It is common for her to want to wait three dates or so because she feels if she waits that long and if you buy her dinner and a movie three times, the chances are slimmer that you're going to just get yours and then leave her. Well, I tell you this, if I really like a girl, there is no way I want to wait three days to enjoy intimacy with her. I like her. I'm excited by her. That just isn't in my nature. I'm a bon vivant. I like to live well, and I like to experience everything in its entirety. I always explain to a girl that I am not content to just look at her. I make no apologies for my desires as a man. I explain to her that I love life and have no desire to bridle my enthusiasm for life. I will tell her something like this. I will say, it is not in my nature to experience things only partially. I am a lover of life. I like to live well and I need to experience everything in its entirety. If I travel to another country, for instance, I don't stay on the tourist track. I can't help but immerse myself fully into the culture, to absorb it through my skin, to breathe it, to live it, to fade into it. A woman to me is like wine, like a fine wine of the rarest vintage. I can't be content with just looking at her. I absolutely must experience this wine on all levels. I need to smell it, to draw in the exquisite bouquet, to carefully observe its clarity and color, its texture and nuance. And finally, I must drink it all in, savoring every drop, tasting it, experiencing it, breathing it, living it, fading into it. Make no apologies for who you are. Trait number six. He never defends himself, ever. Not from a reputation or from a challenge from her. If she challenges him, he makes fun of her. For instance, if she accuses me of being a player, I laugh and say something like, what? So you do know who I am, you lied. He never defend it, deflect it. He never defends himself from a reputation. When accused of being a player or whatever, he neither denies nor confirms. He makes fun of the situation. You have no need to defend yourself. You know who you are. By defending yourself, you validate it. The most I'll ever defend myself is something, something like this. Here's an example conversation. 
I'll, be, I'll say something like this to a girl, I'll say, you know what I'm all about? I'm the most honest guy you've ever met. I'm not like other guys. Most guys will hide their natural impulses because they really like you and they want to give you a good impression. I don't. The difference between me and them is that I really like you and I let it be known I don't hide my desires. And she'll say something like, so you're a player. I never play with emotions. I desire you. That much is true. I very much want you to stay. But if you go, I understand. Either way, you have my highest respect, but you should stay. You're cute. And she will say something like, I don't want to, I don't want to just be another one of your girls. I understand. Listen, I like you a lot. You're definitely my type of girl. I want to see you now and in the future. I can only promise you two things. Number one, I will never lie to you or play with your emotions. And number two, I will take you higher than you've ever been. You see, an enlightened seducer knows the truth that he never plays with a woman's emotions. And because he knows this, he is at peace with himself and he has no need to attempt an apology or justification for the way he is. He loves women. He desires neither empathy nor absolution or even understanding. He has no need to defend himself because women are his greatest defenders. Never respond to her challenges. Here's another example of a story. Um, I was in a, a bar one time and I was leaning kind of like on the bar and out of the corner of my eye, I saw this girl making a beeline through the crowd towards me. And I thought, uh oh, here comes trouble. And so I stood up and I'm standing there and sure enough, she came and tapped me on the shoulder and I turned around and she said, excuse me, are you Zan? And I said, yes. And, um, and she says, I thought so. You tried to pick up my friend Judy. And I'm like, really? Was I successful? And uh, she's like, no, she saw right through your little games right away. And I said to her, I said, well, you know, maybe, maybe I was trying to get to Judy, but really to get to Judy, to get to you, to get to know you. And she laughs and she says, she says, no, as if your, your little games wouldn't work on me. You think you're this guy. And, uh, and so she was giving me all these challenges and stuff at, and I said to her, I said, you know, I think my games would work on you quite well, actually. And she says, uh, um, she said, I don't think so. Um, she said, okay, if you think you're so good, she says, go ahead, say something, say something, try and seduce me. <laughs> and so I said, okay, yeah, well, I'll, I'll respond to that. So I leaned into her and I put my arm around her like this and I'm leaning right in and I'm right in close to her face. And I said, I said to her kind of whispering, I said, did you, did you come through the crowd just now to come say hello to me, come talk to me? And she said, yes. And I said, then I've already seduced you. And I walked away. Trait number seven. He never takes himself, her, or the situation seriously. He is not afraid to use self-deprecating humor. Everything is said with a smile and a wink, like an inside, an inside secret that they both share. The ability to make fun of yourself. That's important. He who laughs at himself will never cease to be amused. What most men don't understand is this. When a woman says in dating profiles or magazine surveys, polls, that she likes a sense of humor in a man, this is what she's talking about. A man who has the confidence to make fun of himself. The true seducer understands this. You know, we try and be too cool. We try to make jokes at others' expense. That is not the type of humor that women, are, that women find attractive. You know, Antonio Banderas, when interviewed about the movie Zorro, he said, the thing that makes Zorro appealing, or anyone appealing, is a sense of humor. It's so important that Zorro has the capacity of laughing at himself. If you can't do that, the character becomes arrogant. This is critical. It's critical. And as Robert Greene said uh, about seducers in his classic work, The Art of Seduction, he said, all have a sense of style and self-deprecation. A quick example is when you go up to a girl somewhere and she lets you know she's not interested. 
Most people get rejected and walk away. I just say something like whatever, like, oh man, I can never get girls. You just make fun of it, this whole situation. Now this is very misunderstood. Whenever I say this in a talk, in a city somewhere, invariably, I have guys coming up to me afterwards saying, listen, I agree with everything you said, it was wonderful, except the part of making fun of myself. I would never do that. Well, that's why you have no girlfriend. Be very clear that I am not talking about neurotic, self-effacing, self-degrading humor, a la Woody Allen. I'm not talking about that, that's not what I mean. That's putting yourself down, that's different. I'm talking about having enormous fun in life, with or without her, laughing at her and at yourself. It portrays confidence. It demonstrates that you are used to winning on a level that no amount of posing beside your Porsche with your cool shades and flexing your lats could ever do. It shows confidence. Another example that I could give you uh, to demonstrate what you should, should act like if a girl is pretending to be offended, if you kind of maybe cross the line a little bit. So if I'm talking to a girl and I got my hand on her back and I'm like, you know, you're kind of cute, uh, you and I should get together. And she'll say something like, hold on, I just told you I was, I just told you I'm married. She's pretending to be offended. You pretend to be sorry and go, I know, you know, hold out your hand for her to slap it or slap your own hand. I can never get girls. Say something like that. Trait number eight. He realizes the massive importance of body language. He studies that carefully. There was a, a study conducted in England, a scientific study that says that communication is 93% body language. In other words, they say that 55% of a person's judgment is based on visual perception. That is, how you look, and how you stand, and how you approach her. And 38% is based on your voice tone. Only 7% of the impression you make on a woman depends on what you actually say. That's why opening lines are irrelevant. Now one doesn't need to be a rocket scientist to quickly realize that if 93% of the impression we make has to do with our looking all right and, and, and talking in a certain way, then women are relying on their senses to form their opinions about us. Not what we say at all. Many women will in fact decide whether or not they like us during the first 10 seconds. It seems incredible that what we have to say to her when introduced has so little consequence. She already has an impression of you. But naturals know this. He knows that a man falls in love through his eyes, but a woman falls in love through her ears. Body language is everything. The natural seducer focuses on her like there is no one else in the world. He is a master of his body language and voice intonation. He leans into her inviting her to share herself in return. He smiles with his eyes and his whole being. This is the essence of charm. The aura that some people give off, he knows this and practices it. Eye contact is so important. We don't use it enough. Eye contact is huge. Smile and wink at her. Here's an example of, of the way I would approach a girl in a club or a party or whatever. I always immediately touch them. My hand is on her back the moment, before I say anything, I always move in from the side. Some guys will approach from the front with their drink, whatever, and they'll say, hi, how are you doing, and uh, what's your name, etc. They kind of do that. Some guys approach indirectly from behind, so that they don't, I don't know. I approach kind of naturally from the side. And uh, so when I'm talking to a girl, I'm not directly talking to her like this. I'm on the side like this, and I kind of rock in. I, I don't know how else to describe it, I'm just like, Hello, what's your name? And, and as I do, I, my hand is on the small of her back immediately. That's where my hand is. The moment I talk to the girl, it doesn't matter who it is, I'm touching her, hand is on the small of her back. And um, that's the, the, the first thing I do. And then I'm talking to her kind of on the side like this, and I lean out, and I'll come back in again to say something. It's just the way I kind of do it. And uh, when you do that, when you're used to putting your, 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 to touching girls, I guess, putting your hands on them, I always do the small of the back. I never, you know, like the shoulder or elbow or <laughs> hold the hand. I don't do anything like that. I just touch the small of the back. It's the way I do it. And it becomes natural. They allow it because it's the way you are. 
If you never ever, if you, if you meet a girl and you never approach her in that familiar way, and then you try and do it later on in another encounter, for instance, with her, she'll kind of go, why are you touching me? But with some guys, it's just natural that they do that, and, they, and women will allow it. They're like, that's the way he is, and they don't even notice it. Here's an example of what, uh, what I'm talking about when I say that women will allow men certain liberties that they would never allow other men. I was standing in a crowded nightclub one time with, with two beautiful girls who I just met. They knew each other. And I was, had one on this hand here and one on this side. And I was talking to these two girls. And we had a good rapport and we were laughing and having fun. And all of a sudden one of the girls says, uh, let's get out of here and go, go over in the corner over there or somewhere else. Uh, because that guy coming through the crowd, we don't like him. And I looked and sure enough, coming through the crowd was a guy and he was kind of looking around for the girls and he was heading towards us. And I said, well, what's the matter with him? Why don't you, why don't you girls like that guy? And they said, well, we don't like him because he's always got his hands on us, he's always touching us. We call him Mr. Gropey and uh, we just don't like that. And uh, I laughed because at the very same moment that they said that, and I pointed it out to them, I had my hand on the small of each of their back with my little finger kind of tucked into the jeans. And I had, since the moment I met them, I had been touching them the whole time. And I laughed and I said to them, I said, listen, you call him Mr. Gropey, I've been touching you guys since I met you. And they laughed as well because they realized what they had just said. And they said, well, they didn't notice. They said, we didn't notice you were touching us because with you it was different. It seems more natural. And, and uh, I, that's a difference. That's what I'm talking about when women will allow certain liberties to men who have good intentions and are having fun as opposed to guys who are trying to take something from them and grope them, Mr. Grope. Trade number nine. He knows that women are not attracted to men who are good looking. They are attracted to men who are attractive. Big difference. You know, we have this notion that all successful seducers must have been good looking. A quick study of the history of the great seducers will disabuse you of that notion immediately. History is replete with examples of men who were not good looking at all, who were too short, and yet who could seduce any woman they desired. So some of the most notorious women are womanizers out there were just plain looking guys or even quite ugly. Look at some of the paintings of Casanova. Not what we would call a very good looking guy. But Casanova said this about himself. He said this, I was not handsome, but I had something better than beauty, a striking way of expressing myself, which always compelled interest in my favor. Now, considering his first sexual encounter was a threesome with two nuns, I would say he had a very compelling way of expressing himself. Jean-Paul Sartre, the great philosopher and even greater, greater ladies' man, was notoriously beastly ugly, and yet women fell at his feet. He was four foot nine. One eye went this way, one eye went that way. Look at pictures of him. Go Google him. It has been written about him that women fell for him because he knew how to explain their soul to them. That's the secret. The language of women is words themselves. Men fall in love through their eyes, women fall in love through their ears. Voltaire said, give me five minutes to explain away my ugly face and I can bed the Queen of France. No idle boast. These guys were good. So don't ever let that be an excuse. Some guy said to me in New York recently, I feel like I am too short for women to be attracted to me. I told him the only thing he was short on was the will to cast off his self-limiting beliefs. So those were plain and ugly men, and yet they have the ability to mesmerize everyone around them. Women I have talked to have a term for guys like this. Now please note, this is not something that most men are aware of. It is strictly a woman speak. They describe a man like this as being sexy ugly. This term is, is well known to women, but virtually unknown to men. There was a Salon article that described the term. It said this, the sexy ugly guy is one who works on you in spite of yourself, 
who shows up in your erotic dreams, not because you want him there, but simply because he's asserting his right to be there. Women know within five minutes of meeting a guy whether or not they would sleep with him. They know right away. A girlfriend of mine once told me that women have this thing called the hover factor. This refers to a test they have, that women have, with a guy within 30 seconds of meeting him, it goes like this. If she can picture him hovering over her, as in a sexual position hovering over top of her, she will be receptive to sleeping with him if everything works out that way. If she can't get that picture of this guy hovering over her, she will never sleep with him, ever. Here's an example of how powerful what I'm talking about can be. This happened to me one time, I was in a local pub with a friend and we just happened to meet up with another guy that he knew and the guy's fiance. And she was gorgeous. So we were sitting around a small round table and the guy's fiance was sitting beside me to my left, round table. The guy was across from me and my friend was on my right. So we were sitting there talking and joking and carrying on and having some wine and getting to know each other. My friend kept engaging the other guy in conversation. So this girl and I were left talking to each other a fair amount. She told me she was a massage therapist and she was running her business out of her home. So I said, hey, you know, I should, uh, maybe I should come over and get a massage sometime. Her boyfriend heard this and started talking about what a great massage therapist she was and how her business was just starting to take off and that, yeah, I should go get a massage from her and I should tell all my friends. So this carried on to the evening and we had, you know, great rapport. I was talking to this girl a lot, friendly banter. And then suddenly, three glasses of Pinot Noir later, while the other two guys were talking and engaging each other, she started telling me something or other, and I could see in her eyes that there was something else. So I cut her off in mid-sentence. She was telling me something, I cut her off in mid-sentence and I said, you realize, of course, that you and I are going to get together. I said this with a dead, serious look on my face. I cut her off in mid-sentence and I said that to her. She looked absolutely stunned. She stared at me with her mouth hanging open. And then after about five seconds, she quietly whispered, yes. Of course, I didn't follow through with it. But I just wanted to illustrate to you how powerful the mindset of a natural can be when you have the skill set to be able to amplify attraction and to concentrate chemistry like that, it's very powerful. It's a very powerful thing to learn. Now we come to trait number 10. To an enlightened seducer, his relationships never end. Think about that for a second. A natural realizes this. He is connected to the women in his life forever. All men who are naturals are friends with women. There is no animosity towards him. There are no hard feelings toward him, and they never say a bad word about him, even long after they are no longer together as a couple. How in the world is this possible? Here's how. A woman will only feel cheated if she thought you promised something to her that you didn't deliver. A woman will only say bad things about you if she thought she was going to get something that she didn't get. We make long-term promises on short-term feelings. But you were honest with her. You know, you don't know about the future. And you gave her room to breathe. You respected her that much. So his relationship with her never ends. As I said before, sure, he may not be with her physically throughout her life, but he has touched her so profoundly that she will always carry him around in her heart. Through all of her subsequent relationships and breakups, she will always think of you. A natural knows that he might not be the one she is with forever, but he is the one she will remember forever. And that is a gift. A gift you give to her, and a gift she gives to you. To give you an example of what I mean when I say that to a natural seducer, his relationships never end. Let me give you the example of my 40th birthday party. My girlfriend threw me a surprise birthday party on that day at my house. What was cool about it was she invited a whole bunch of my ex-girlfriends, women that I used to have in my life. There was probably nine girls that came 
to this party for me. And what was cool about it was it was a lingerie party. My girlfriend knew me so well that she thought what better party to celebrate Zan's 40th birthday party than to have all his ex-girlfriends around him wearing lingerie. And I couldn't agree more. It was one of the most beautiful days of my life. It was profound. I remember looking around. It was a surprise party. I didn't know it was going to happen. All these girls were there to celebrate me, me. And I was standing there and looking around in the room at all these beautiful girls who have created who I am, who have added to my life immensely. And I thought, what a profound moment. This is the goal. This is what you want to create in your life, that kind of beauty. Yeah, people move in and out of your life. That's irrelevant. They brought beauty into your life and they're still beautiful today. You still miss them. You still adore them today. You still delight in them. They'll always be your friends and they'll always be with you forever. Let's discuss the notion of men, what it means to be a man today. We all know something has changed. Society has changed for men and for women. The invention of the pill 40 years ago sparked the sexual revolution and gave us all the sexual freedom that we have and enjoy today. We all, both men and women, feel this is a good thing. But deep down, we can't shake the feeling that we might have lost something vital along the way. As a result, men today feel lost. Marriage doesn't seem to work anymore. Women and men simply don't get invested as deeply today as they once did. Intentions are noble, dreams are sky high, and yet all around us we see the smoking wreckage of relationships. A man who is just recovering from the destruction of his marriage or relationship is terrified of the notion of trying to navigate the dating waters of society today. Everywhere I go, the message I hear from men is the same. They are confused and not sure exactly how to approach today's woman, let alone date her or have a relationship with her. A lot of men, unfortunately, are becoming more and more bitter, more sad and more jaded because of their fundamental confusion. Misogyny runs rampant, not necessarily overt, of course, but simmering beneath the surface in a very large number of men today. Our traditional roles that of provider and protector have been virtually negated for a variety of reasons. For thousands of years, women have needed men to have those roles, to be their providers and protectors. For thousands of years. Well, today's woman has demonstrated that she is perfectly capable of providing for herself, thank you very much, and perfectly capable of protecting herself. In today's society, men feel they are gradually losing their utility to women. So what's left? It feels like there is no longer someone for everyone. There is no longer a lid for every pot. Society today makes it so that a few get a lot and some get none. Sounds pretty discouraging, right? What do women need us for anyway? Well, the answer is a good one. Women still need us to celebrate them. They can't live without it. Amidst all this confusion, despite the fact that today's woman has been raised on women's magazines, magazines that are dedicated to putting men and their motives under a microscope, in spite of, of all the warnings from their somewhat bitter and jaded girlfriends, in spite of all the media talk shows, woman remains, at heart, a female, waiting for guys like you. Women still want to be seduced. They love intrigue. I say this all the time, but it's true. Women are complicit in their own seduction. They want it more than you do. Every woman wants to be in a love story. The man who realizes this one simple truth realizes everything. A woman is complicit in her own seduction, and a man who understands this is forever surrounded by beauty. So in today's society, men have lost their way. We no longer know how to be men. We simply can't understand the dating scene. Everything our fathers told us no longer applies. We're not sure if we should open the door for her, if we should pay. We should wait two days before we call so we don't appear needy. Or is it three? 
we don't know anymore? Should we be sensitive and considerate? Sharing our feelings with others, with other men, and crying, crying often? Or should we steel ourselves against the vagaries of life, shouldering our burden as men with a resolute and silent determination? This whole notion, the whole notion of manliness, of masculinity, has been modified, made more sensitive, more politically correct, more blended, more safe, more manageable, more feminine. And women everywhere are losing faith. They're wringing their hands at the lack of real men in the world. The whole idea behind the equality movement is that men and women are to recognize that they are equal. But somewhere, it got warped into the notion that men and women should become the same. The ridiculous notion that there is no difference between the genders. Men and women today are blending. Our roles are overlapping. We are becoming the same, but not equal. That was the goal. The goal was equality. The result is sameness. There's the problem. Now the multi-billion dollar self-help industry has missed men completely. The reason for this is simple. It ignores what rings true to men. It is all about changing external things about him, his appearance, his environment, etc. But not his essence, not his presence, not his core. In our interactions with women, if we only concentrate on external tactics and techniques, the external things, we miss the only thing about us that women will really respond to. And one of the fundamental things that men are missing today is the very notion of manliness, what it means to be a man. Women are looking for it and can't find it. Men today have a secret fear of women. Why? Because we realize, we think, she has all the power. Most men feel they need a woman to validate them, to prove to themselves that someone out there can find them attractive. But if it is true that the majority of men crave validation from a woman, then the converse must also be true. She also has the power to invalidate him, to reject him. This stops men in their tracks, scares them to their very core and they begin to resent this power that women have over them. How did we get this way? What has changed? Why is it so difficult? As we all know, dating relationships have devolved into a series of manipulation and mind games and a contest of wills. There's a kind of mean spirit that permeates relationships today. As men, we are increasingly apprehensive and unsure, masking our fundamental desires for the sake of political correctness and, quite frankly, for our own sanity. We have to. This is because in today's dating world, if you state your desire for her too enthusiastically, you lose. So instead, we learn that we must be aloof and act uncaring and cool, when what we really want to say is, you excite me and I can't wait to see you again. We really do want to say that to a woman who delights us, but we can't. We become too sensitive too cautious, too afraid, too aloof, and too detached. I am completely unrestrained with women and having enormous fun. I am a slave to my love of women, and they can sense it. The weakness of women is language and words. Fortunately, this is one of my strong points. And I act like they are from Mars if they try to repel my advances, like it doesn't make any sense. So I'll say like, uh, come out with me for a drink tonight, I'll pick you up at seven. I can't, my boyfriend wouldn't like it. Oh, hey, I understand. Let's make it eight then. That's an example of the kind of thing I would say to a girl, keep it fun and light. Or this. I would say, uh, you know what? You're kind of cute. You have the second nicest eyes I've ever seen. You'd make a good girlfriend for me. I think I'm going to call you. Oh, you think so, do you? Of course. I'm going to call you tomorrow night. Wait by the phone. I never, ever worry about a woman's resistance to me. If she says she is not interested and leaves, no problem. I understand. I respect that. But if I ever see her again, I immediately go up to her, smile and wink, and pick up right where I left off, as if she had never resisted me in the first place. In other words, her boyfriend objections or whatever mean nothing. So I go up to her again, I just see her again, I'm big smile, I'm like, hello sweetie, did you miss me? She's like, hardly. I, tell you, I want to see you, tell me your number and I'll remember it. No, I told you last time I have a boyfriend. Oh, so you're still seeing Norman? Uh, his name's not Norman. I smile and wink and go, oh, really? That's very interesting. You know, I have two bottles of champagne at home. No thanks. Yeah, I have two bottles. One to drink and one to pour all over your body. 
This will get her laughing. She'll say, you never give up, do you? And I will say, of course not. Wouldn't be the same if I did now, would it? No, I suppose not. But that's just me. That's how I interact with women. I keep it fun and light. Because it's fun. You know, it used to be that fathers and sons lived together for many years in close proximity, doing and learning together, trying and failing together. Fathers generally had a trade, a skill that was learned over many years, and sons would spend a lot of time with their fathers learning the same trade, watching as they worked. Of course, the son did not always follow in his father's footsteps. He often eventually chose a very different profession. But none of that mattered because the key was the close connection they shared in those formative years. The son trying to emulate his father and learning what it means to be a man. We have largely lost that today. There are fewer trades and more cubicles. There are fewer homes today where the father is present at all, either physically or emotionally. Most husbands and wives have split up, remarried, become single parents, or moved away. There are all kinds of configurations and permutations. Even the homes where the fathers are physically there, they are hardly ever involved in any meaningful way in their son's life. Modern man comes home from the office to his wife and his stepchildren, helps out around the house somewhat, and then collapses in front of the television. It is a rare man today who spends time with his son. He is either not there at all or too distracted, too busy. Of course, this is a generalization, but true in an increasingly large number of households. The result is a generation of men, our generation, that has been raised largely by women. And a mother wants her son to be safe. A father will build a jump for his son's bike. A mother would never allow it. A father will teach his son to hunt and fish. A woman is not interested in that. A father will teach his son to go out there and try to win. A mother will teach him that competition is bad, that everyone should win. And so today, we are surrounded by boys who grew up to be men that a woman would create. He is kind, considerate, safe, moderate, sensitive, but lacking an edge and a strength that his father would have given him. He's lacking something fundamental that women need and crave in a man. And this is a big reason why women today are so uninspired by the choice they have in men out there. And the cycle feeds itself and gets worse. And this is the essence of the nice guy in the dating world today. These are the guys who either didn't have any kind of a father at all or whose fathers were dominated by their wives. Of course, the extreme opposite of the nice guy is the jerk. We all know guys like that. Well, believe it or not, both the nice guy and the jerk are created by the exact same shaping influence, the lack of a father figure that they respected in their formative years. One takes the path of submissiveness, believing that women will not like him if he doesn't cater to them, and attempts to show that he will do anything for them. The nice guy. This is what they watch their father do. The other bears in his heart fear and a faint hatred of women in general. He never saw a man respecting a woman as he was growing up, or he felt dominated and manipulated by his mother. Generation after generation, fathers handed down wisdom to their sons. This is how you be a man. This is how you wield an ax. This is how you treat a woman. Men were masculine, women were feminine. This model of handing down the wisdom of the ages from father to son worked very well right up until about 30, 40 years ago. Our generation. Our grandfathers received knowledge from their fathers, etc., etc. Open the door for a lady son, take charge. Well, when our grandfathers and fathers tried to hand down the same guidebook to us, the navigational charts on how to be a man and how to treat a woman, our ships hit rocks and ran aground. But it has been the model for thousands of years in every society, the Greeks, the Romans. Information has, been, has always been crucially passed from fathers to sons, until now. For the first time in history, it has all changed. That's why men feel lost. It is different today than it has ever been. We live in a world where either we had no fathers to tell us how to be men, or if we did, we discovered that 
none of the instructions they gave us applies in the dating world today. It's all different. Again, this is a very simple way of describing something that is extremely complex and it's merely my take on things. I'm not a psychoanalyst. There are many different influences that we observed and experienced growing up. All of it contributed to who we are today. But the essence of what I'm saying here is true. The lack of a proper role model father in our life is something that society today has lost. I believe that the loss of our fathers or the lack of approval of our fathers or the loss of respect for our fathers is by far the biggest reason we have dysfunction in our relationships with women. It is why we can't get a date, it is why a woman will not trust us with her body, it is why we can't keep her, it is why we put her on a pedestal, it is why, why they don't respect us, it is why we mistreat and abuse her, it is why we are jerks to her, it is why we are so unfulfilled and so lost today. We are a generation of wounded men, all of us have unhealed wounds. Our fathers intentionally or unintentionally shot a met metaphorical arrow into our heart when we were young, sure, we have broken off the shaft of the arrow and the skin has long since closed over the wound. But we have never truly healed. We still have the arrowhead inside of us that first pierced us. Rather, we have defined our lives around our wounds and the process of accepting them. And there is no answer out there in the multi-billion dollar self-help industry for men. All the books, all the programs, all the, all the, all the saccharine and misguided dating advice all the television shows, the talk shows, have failed men miserably. Men have lost their way and they see no help. This is why there is a new man's movement afoot. It is relatively new, created not by relationship gurus. We've always had those men and women who give dating advice, who try to teach men how to have more meaningful relationships. Men today have recognized it all for what it is. Bullshit. It doesn't apply today. What our fathers never told us, or told us badly, is the biggest reason that we no longer know how to relate to women. And that includes you. You have a wound. The difference with you and others is that you recognize there is something lacking in your soul, are tired of it, and are taking steps to change it. Essentially, what we are all sharing with each other today is the talk our fathers never gave us. Women know what you're all about right away. Within a few seconds, she's already categorized you. She does this with every man she meets for her whole life. There's five boxes that women have. There's either this box over here and she puts every man into one of these boxes right away within a few seconds. You're in one of those boxes when you, when you, when you meet a girl. The one over here is, eh, that guy's kind of creepy, I don't like him at all. You're in that box. This box over here is neither here nor there. Just a guy, I don't, know, I don't think anything about him at all. There's that box. This box here is, that guy's a nice guy, I mean, he would make a nice friend for me. The fourth box is long-term potential. I really like this guy. I might be able to get something with this guy long-term. So I have to play my cards right and be discreet and very nice and kind and around him. The fifth box is, I would like to sleep with that guy. You're in one of those boxes with every girl you know, every single one and it's very difficult to get moved from one box to the other. She puts you in one of those boxes immediately. All women have the same rating system. So who are these creatures that inhabit the earth called women? Men today have the viewpoint that it is us over here and them over there. So many men view women as some kind of enemy, like a force to be conquered or overcome. The dating and relationship scene is viewed is some kind of a struggle or epic battle. Men are over here, arrayed on a hill, staring helplessly across an abyss of silence at women in their walled and imposing fortress. We gather in our trenches and we draw up elaborate strategies and ingenious plans to find a way to effectively breach their walls. Men sometimes try a direct assault, finding themselves dodging a rainstorm of arrows and boiling oil for if anything, women are very skilled at defending against a direct attack. So we retreat and lick our wounds. Surely there must be a better way. So we try sending out scouts. We try to intercept and disrupt their female communications to understand them. And when we do, we work feverishly through the night trying to break their codes. 
You've heard about chick logic, paying attention to what she does, not what she says. That's code breaking. When that doesn't work, some in our ranks, some men suggest that maybe we should become spies. You know, act like we are not the enemy, that our intentions are not to gain access to the fortress. We just want to hang around outside the walls. We want to be friends. We have no interest in actually entering. We're content to just wander around outside as long as she allows us to remain close. We give her rides everywhere. We do all these things. She, of course, allows it and doesn't attack us with her arrows because she feels her intentions are just that. We only want to be friends. That's what we tell her. But our intentions are not just that. This is a secret attempt to tunnel underneath her walls. We hope she is lulled into a false sense of safety. Our intentions are entirely noble, after all, but when she isn't looking, we are sure working hard to burrow our way under the walls. Is it war? Is that a rather harsh way of describing it? Not to a lot of men. They really feel like they have seen combat. Their war stories about their battles with women are legion. But there is a different way. There are some men who can ride up to her walls, solitary, who approach her gates directly, honestly, and openly. I am not your enemy. I am not going to hurt you. I am not about to attack you. I am on your side. Let me in. And guess what? She does. She opens her gate willingly and lets him in. This is where you want to be. You want to be a friend to women not her enemy. You know, 150 years ago, Thoreau wrote, the mass of men live lives of quiet desperation. This is as true today as it was back then. How many men look out the window and wonder where it all went? Why the world hasn't provided him with what he always dreamed about? We grew up in a world that didn't look anything like the world we really wanted to grow up in. You know, we wanted epic adventures and what did we get? two weeks vacation. We wanted a mission and what did we get? A lawn that needs mowing. We wanted a purpose and we got a cubicle. We wanted a beautiful damsel and we got a jaded career women. We wanted a noble steed. We ended up with a minivan. We wanted a castle and we got a mortgage. We wanted wisdom and we got insipid talk shows. We wanted treasure and what did we get? Endless debt. Imagine, if you will, your ideal woman. Most of us have this image already in us. It is the girl that would make us happy forever, if only we could find her. It might be someone you know or, or have known in your past. You might be a film star. You might be a completely fictitious woman, maybe conjured up in books you have read. Or maybe there isn't a lot of substance to her at all. Maybe she is just your overarching concept of womanness a composite image. Think of it like this. She is the woman that would make you forget every other woman if you could just have her in your life. She is the woman that would make it unnecessary for you to be listening to me talk about this right now. She is the woman that would finally, finally make you happy, make you inspired. She is the one you would love your friends to see you with. Walking into a club or a party with her on your arm. How would you feel the whole time? You would feel this intense level of confidence because she is with you and nobody else at the party. What you have just imagined is the image of your ideal woman. We all have that in us. A lot of you have conquered the business world, have great friends, have cool things you like to do as hobbies, but you don't yet have her, this woman that you imagine. You see, formed in each of us in our earliest years is our personal version of the ideal woman. No one has the same image in mind. Here's a poem I wrote a long time ago. Man has only ever searched for three things in this world. The perfect note, the source of light, and alabaster girl. You see, I call this ideal woman that each of us has inside of us, the alabaster girl, a vision so perfect and so lovely and so complete in us and so rare that no real woman could ever come close to approximating her. Our alabaster girl that we all hold and cherish inside of us is a compilation of all the traits that we desire in women. She might be vaguely similar to our mother, or she might not. She might be what we remember from a childhood encounter, like 
like Nabokov's description of the long ago childhood vision of Annabelle in his book Lolita. Plato also talked about the idea of a perfect chair that we all have in our consciousness. We all know what it means, but none of us have ever seen. We have all seen chairs, of course, but what is the one perfect ideal version of a chair? We don't know. We have only seen approximations of it. In other words, we have only seen chairs with varying degrees of chairness, nothing that is the ideal chair or our ideal woman. Whatever your vision, and none of us have the same vision, understand this. You will never find her. It is a search without end. Your alabaster girl that you desire so intensely that would make the world feel whole again, that would make you feel whole again, that would make you believe in love again, is forever out of your reach. Over and over again, time after time, we might think we have found her. Every girl we encounter throughout our lives, our latest new girlfriend or lover, the, the pretty girl we saw in the bookstore, the girl dancing so seductively on the speakers at the club, the girl across the room. We compare every girl to this image inside of us of our alabaster girl. We squint and we scrutinize and we say, wow, this is her. I finally found her. In our eagerness to convince ourselves that this new woman in our life is indeed our ideal woman, we overlook everything about her that doesn't quite sync with that image. That's the problem because inevitably over time, we come to realize that this latest obsession of ours is really just a woman replete with faults, fears, insecurities. It has been well said that the things you absolutely love about her when you first fall in love that you're blinded to are the things that annoy you later. You might have liked her independence. Then later you can't stand her independence. You might have loved the fact that she was fun to take to parties. But later you hate that she still wants to go to parties with or without you. You might be delighted by the fact that she likes to laugh and have fun a lot. Later, you wonder why can't you just be serious for once? You see, when the realization hits that she is not what we had made her out to be, that she is not our alabaster girl, we men deal with it in a lot of different ways. Some men settle and quietly, dejectedly soldier on. They go out and have a beer with their buddies while she watches her soaps. They go quietly back and forth and carry on with their unremarkable lives. Some men get angry and take it out on her, either through neglect or verbal abuse or violence. It is not her fault that she is not what you envisioned her to be. And yet they blame her and thereafter seek to punish her. But then there are the men, few in number, who recognize the futile nature of that search who realize they will never obtain their cherished alabaster girl. And yet they still embrace this wonderful, beautiful, but flawed woman who loves them, who's in his life, realizing that even though she is not her, they are not settling at all. And so they accept her for who she is, love her, and never get angry or disappointed at her for not being able to live up to this impossible ideal. And this has a quiet beauty to it. The answer we seek can never be found in a woman. You know guys, concluding this section, we are successful in business, we are captains of industry, and yet we feel more and more lost when it comes to discovering what is expected of us in the land of women. Gaining even a small understanding of this shifting dynamic will allow you to stand back somewhat, examine the way of men today, and rediscover your place as a man. It is impossible to effectively attack the creature that you created, that you desire. We think there is much animosity to pick up artists, seducers, etc. from women, but there is nothing to attack. We are not taking something from these women, we are giving them what they need and desire. Women read lots of romance novels not necessarily because they desire that fantasy life more than their current life. Would they really trade their husband and their much-loved children for this alternate life of excitement and reckless abandon? No. But like a prisoner in a cell, with everything you need, books, food, television, all the amenities provided, you're comfortable, all your basic needs are fulfilled. You still look forward to that one hour of exercise a day, 
what you might see a bird or a cloud or a little patch of grass in the tiny little cement yard. That's what it's like for women. They still need to feel passion and energy and life. A man forgets because, well, because he's a man. He forgets there was a time, not so very long ago, when the woman who shares his life was skipping through the fields of her childhood, her dreams floating all about her like little dandelion puffs. And oh, what dreams they were. She was going to grow up and marry a handsome prince on a white horse and live in a castle. She had these dreams. When was it that she let those dreams die? Was it when life, as life does, started to close in on her? The world kills a woman's soul, for you see as she grew and progressed through the tangle of classrooms and career choices, responsibilities and bills, talk shows and women's magazines, life and various men, that part of her began to get smaller and smaller, finally suppressed so deep inside of her that she no longer really believes. Her relationships, castles of sand, so carefully constructed and measured, that once seemed so promising, wash away on the shore, and she is saddened a little more. By the time she has reached adulthood, she has learned to be efficient, tough, and independent. The man she is with today, once so giving, so attentive and aware, so alive, has become a mere caricature, one of Thoreau's men of quiet desperation. She feels unappreciated. He takes her for granted now. Their relationship, propped up and patched, has devolved into a series of slow motion days. What was once vibrant and spontaneous is now pedestrian. Each listless day saturated and heavy with a curious somnambulism. A man knows in his heart the exact moment when it is too late, when she's been neglected just a little too long. He sees but ignores all the signs, until suddenly he feels a jolt in his heart, and at that very moment he senses in a rush of anguish that he has lost her, and everything stops. There is nothing sadder than a man who knows his woman is slipping away, and now there is nothing else but her. Everything that was once so important is relegated to the distant corners of his consciousness. And so now he rushes out to buy flowers, and now he compliments her, and now he writes her that letter, and now he promises her all the things that he knew she wanted all along. But she becomes more distant and disconnected in spite of, or perhaps because of, all his considerable efforts. It is too late, and she is slipping away. Women are a gift from men to me. That's how we see it. With his well-meaning but clumsy and faltering hands, he wraps her up in her fading hopes and dreams in a little gift box with a little bow and hands her to me or men like me. No one ever steals your woman. She leaves of her own volition. You see, when a man comes along that can evoke even the tiniest spark of those dreams and that passion again that she had as a child, she will follow you to the ends of the earth. She might not be connected with you in a relationship down the road, but when you touch a woman on that level, where she can once again be made to feel the freedom and innocence and passion of her youth, throughout all of her subsequent relationships, she will think about you. And that is a gift. A gift you give to her, and a gift she gives to you. That ultimately is the goal. To be a friend to women, to genuinely like them, to adore them, to celebrate them. That's all there is. Everything else pales in comparison. Everything else we try to do is merely an approximation of that fulfillment. Transcendent beauty. Transcendent beauty, that is what a skilled seducer, a lover of women, brings out in her. He recognizes that there is something fundamentally beautiful about women that isn't beauty. It's something else. So, what is modern women thinking? If men today are so lost and confused, we explored that. What about the women? Do they have all the answers? 
Do they perhaps hold all the cards? Do they have the upper hand when it comes to relationships and dating? A lot of us might think so. After all, women have all the resources. They have resources they can draw on wherever they turn. They have women's magazines, magazines that are relentless in their dedication to placing men and their motives under a microscope. They have chiclet. They have sex in the city. They have romantic comedies. They have opera. They have rom romance novels. They have the self-help industry, and they have their girlfriends. What do men have when it comes to relationship advice? Each other. You know, we go for a beer with our buddy, and we, and we say, you know, we're broken up now. And he says things like, eh, well, plenty of fish in the sea. And we say, yeah, you're right. That's it. That's all the self-help that men have. That's the only resource we have is our buddies. There are more singles today than any other time in history. We have a hookup culture today. There's a very large pool of single men and women circulating out there. Instead of long-term commitments, very large proportions of people get together easily and break up just as easily. Three to five years, that's the life cycle of our relationships today. Woe to you guys with a girlfriend who is approaching 25 years old. Men have a midlife crisis. Women have a quarter century crisis. That is a critical time in a girl's life. She's turning 25 and she starts to think about her future and what she really wants for her life. Do I still want to be a party girl? Or is it time that I got serious about life? Some of my friends are getting married and, and they seem happy. What about me? I have to start thinking about kids real soon. Is my career choice what I really like? It's not too late to change, but it soon will be too late and on and on and on. They think all these things. It's a crisis time. If you are in a relationship with a girl who hits that quarter century mark, put your seatbelt on because you are going for a ride. She's going to be flaky and wistful and wondering and thinking she should move and dreaming and questioning you and questioning herself. It's just the way of women. The age-old question pondered by Freud and countless others, what does woman want? Wasn't there a movie with Mel Gibson called exactly that? As men, we struggle with the, this question immensely because women, as we know, are wired differently than us. They flow with their emotions to such a degree that sometimes we think even they don't know what they want. A lot of men have the feeling today that women never think for themselves. They let society, friends, family, and media think for them. Her friends pick her boyfriend. That's what a lot of men think. What do women want? I'll tell you the number one thing I think women want. They want to be seen as the beauty. Not just beautiful, but the beauty, transcendent beauty. They want to be delighted in. They have wanted that from the time they were little girls. Like I said, women today have learned to be efficient, tough, and independent. And believe me, they are weary of this exterior. I have a friend in New York that told me he knows a lot of very powerful women there. I'm talking about investment bankers, real estate moguls, company presidents, CEOs, etc. And what they have overwhelmingly told him is that they would give it all up for romance, to be swept off their feet, to be delighted in. So what will women universally respond to, even powerful women, a man who will delight in her and celebrate her? A man that will awaken even the tiniest spark of that innocence and passion she had as a little girl. That's what she wanted from her daddy, and that is what she is still seeking today. Here's the conversation I remember. I was with a girl on her couch, having a nice time, beautiful girl. She said to me, I really like you, but I need to get to know someone first to feel comfortable. To which I replied, you know, and I know that we have been connected forever. I am different from other guys and you know it. We have been comfortable, comfortable with each other from the moment our eyes first met. We are lovers. And she said, lovers? We're not lovers. We haven't even made love to each other yet. To which I replied, ah, that is where you're wrong. We are lovers in the truest sense of the word. We haven't made love to each other yet. What do you think we've been doing this whole time? Why not be a woman's fantasy? The cool thing is, you can. You see, women are missing one thing in their lives. 
that romance and passion that they dream about, the feeling of standing too close to the edge, afraid she's going to fall off. I think it was Kundera who described this feeling. He said, he said, that feeling of vertigo you get when you're standing on a high cliff, looking over the edge, that sort of dizziness is not caused because you're afraid you're going to fall. It's because you're afraid you're going to jump. Women all over are in that state constantly. They're afraid they're going to fall and jump into their fantasy. So be her fantasy. Let her feel free and beautiful and young and pretty again. You can bring that out of her and be her fantasy. You know, I talked earlier about how men were generally shortchanged by the fathers. Well, so are women. There are a lot of women out there, most women, in fact, who are still seeking their father's approval. They have been, they have been doing this since they were little girls. So what do women want? Yes, you will hear women say all kinds of things. They say they want a man with a sense of humor, a sensitive and caring man. And we hear how they all want the nice guy, someone who will finally treat them right. Tired of it, all the other guys. Yeah, right. They don't want that. I laugh at my women friends when they tell me when they tell me they want the nice, sensitive guy who will treat them right. I say to them, you don't really want that. Think about it. Within a 10-mile radius of us right now, there are literally hundreds of men who would do anything to be with you. They would buy you flowers every day. They'd take you to dinner. They'd pay attention to your every women desire. They would be so nice and treat you so well, your head would spin. But you don't really want that, do you? My women friends, they all laugh and they agree when I tell them that. Because women don't really want the nice guy. But they also don't want the jerk. What they want is an adventure. That's what they want. They want for someone to take them away for a while from their humdrum, everyday existence. It doesn't mean to take them climbing in the Himalayas, it means taking them on an emotional adventure. Now the problem with most men, those hundreds of men that live within a 10 mile radius of her, those wonderful men, nice guys, who would buy her anything, do anything for her, be there for her, be really sweet and nice to her, is that they would make her the adventure. And she knows it. She doesn't want that. A woman does not want to be the adventure. She wants to be part of something larger than herself. She wants to be taken on an adventure. She wants a man with a purpose that isn't her. You know, think about why women are attracted to jerks, to dangerous men. The reason they are is because they like that he is not focused on her. And she makes it her project to change him. She loves the challenge. She wants what she can't have and she can't have him. It's because he's too wrapped up in himself and his own drama to pay any attention to her. One of the ironies of life is that women are attracted to the untamable man. And when she lands him, she tries to tame him. She tries to get him to settle down, to quit hanging out with his buddies, to start driving a minivan. If she succeeds, she has killed the very things in him she found attractive in the first place, his strength and independence. And then she decries a lack of any real men. When women ask why there are no real men, the answer is this. You turn him into a woman. That's why. But how is this for an idea? What about the notion that a man can be all those things a woman says she wants? Buys her things, walks in the park, brings her flowers, etc. But is still untamable. In other words, he isn't a jerk at all. Remember, he delights in her but he never makes empty promises about forever. That is a man who is a combination of the attractive elements of the nice guy as well as the attractive elements of the jerk. Makes sense. It's all in your frame of reference. You always hear that you should never buy things for girls like flowers or gifts, candy. We are so afraid of what is called supplication. But you will discover that a man goes through three stages in his understanding of women. Stage number one, he's really nice. He buys dinners, movies, gives her rides, buys flowers. He tries to be charming and funny, but he gets few women. He's the nice guy. Stage two, he backs off from buying that stuff and being too available because it doesn't work. And he learns not to supplicate. He gets more women at that stage. Stage three, 
he buys her whatever he wants. Dinners, movies, flowers, candy, gives her rides. He has grown out of the stage where supplication is an issue and he never thinks about it again and he gets tons of women. It's because he isn't needy and he can do these things. Here's two scenarios. Scenario A, a guy buys a hundred dollar bottle of champagne and pours it for a girl. He is trying to impress her and make himself more attractive in her eyes. He asks himself, does she like me? Does she like me? She smells this neediness, happily drinks his champagne, then goes home with someone else. Scenario B, a guy buys a hundred dollar bottle of champagne and pours it for a girl. Same thing. He is having fun tonight with or without her. It's like, you're kind of cute, so come have some champagne with me. He asks himself, do I like her? Do I like her? She drinks his champagne and hopes he will include her in his fun and exciting world. Here's the key. If you buy a drink for that hot girl there, and you can't buy a drink for the 80-year-old man down at the end of the bar, you fail. You're missing the whole point. Most men try to buy a girl's attention to buy the relationship. Enlightened seducers, guys who are good with women, do things for their own reasons. He never thinks, if I do this for her, maybe she will like me better. Most men, when they meet a girl like that, a girl that they like, they constantly ask themselves, does she like me, does she like me? This is key. Naturals, enlightened seducers, they ask themselves, do I like her, do I like her? They are not buyers, they're sellers. The truth is, if a girl really likes you, there is very little you can do to screw it up. There is a reason that the largest genre of books sold today by far are romance novels. Why? Because there is not enough passion in a woman's life. What do they want? Every woman wants to be in a love story. And that's what women want. What is love? Can anyone really answer that question? If you are in love, what is it that you are in love with? Her? Or the idea of her? Her goodness? Or your perception of her goodness? Do you love her for her and all her beauty? Or do you love her because of what she does for you? As we know, love masquerades as many things. But is there such a thing as true, lasting love? I'll tell you what, I'll define love and you think about whether or not you agree. Okay, here goes. Love is that feeling you get when you meet the right girl. Do you agree? Is love really a pleasant sensation that magically and spontaneously generates when she appears? You know, butterflies in the stomach, that euphoric loss of sensibility, that exquisite madness that takes over all our senses. If that's real and love is a feeling, then true love is new love. The problem with this notion that love is the way someone makes us feel is that a feeling comes and a feeling may go. But this is how most of us approach a relationship. We get together and make all kinds of long-term promises to each other because of a feeling. Now it's true that this feeling is one of the most exhilarating and ex exciting feelings you can ever experience in life. In fact, the intensity of our feelings and attraction for each other is usually construed as proof of the intensity of our love. How true it is. I really, really like her. I'm in love with her. It must be true love. If you let a girl know that you like her, it is very direct and very unusual. And frankly, it's quite refreshing for her. She will usually ask you something like, why do you say you like me so much? You just met me and you don't know anything about me. When that happens, say, I don't know. I'm trying to figure that out for myself. I don't know what it is about you. I have lots of girlfriends. I just can't keep my eyes off you. I know I can't give you what you want and deserve. That guy can. All I know is that I feel better when you're around. 
And so we set out together arm in arm with high hopes, feeling so much love and euphoria for each other, for the newness of it all, delirious, crazily in love with each other. And it's good. But inevitably, life, as life does, bears down on us. And the miracle of love slowly fades as disappointments, routine, and boredom begin to encroach. Eventually, we might even feel that the magic just isn't there anymore. We know this is true because everywhere we look, we see broken marriages, broken hearts, broken dreams. Every single one of those broken relationships began, just like I described. They thought this time would be different. This was the one. Intentions are still noble. Dreams are still dreamy. Happily ever after is still the story we all still desire. It's amazing how regularly our relationships crash on the rocks. In fact, can you imagine any other enterprise of humanity that is undertaken with such spectacular optimism? If we failed as regularly in business as we do in love, we would stand back, shake our head and say, okay, something's not working. But in affairs of the heart, we repeat the same cycles over and over again. It's because we think we know what we want. Us men, you know, we see a, a guy who is rich or famous with a hot girl on his arm. And we think, I want one of those. That's what I want. Well, there are plenty of rich, successful men in this world with a trophy girl on their arm, a girl who pretends that she likes him, but she really only tolerates him. Or worse, can't stand him. Yeah, a guy like that might have a, a hot babe, but he is missing something fundamental, something he desperately craves, and he knows it. He knows he's missing something, and it hurts him. This is because we convince ourselves that when we finally have a girl like that in our life, our vision of the perfect woman, we will be head over heels in love. Then, finally, we will be happy. Then, we will stay with that girl forever once we land her. Then, we will marry that one. Then, we will be in love. And why wouldn't we be? We have the girl we have always dreamed about. This is what we think love is. We think that we want that special someone, that perfect someone, that ideal, but oh so elusive woman. A woman whose physical qualities we like. A woman who is sexy, killer body, great in bed. A cover girl. You know, we look in a magazine at one of those, those pristine girls, airbrushed to an almost surreal perfection, and we say, wow, I want one of those for my birthday. Then I'll be happy. Then finally I'll be happy. But the truth is, and this is going to sound strange, and you might even disagree, the truth is, we don't really want that at all. That will not make us happy. Well then what do we mean when we talk of love? Do we mean to have someone like that in our life? No. We mean only one thing. To be loved. To be accepted as we are. That's what that rich guy is craving. All of our discontent in affairs of the heart is really just a longing for someone to desire us. For someone to find us lovable. To be in this cold, gray, dismal world of so little caring. Finally, finally, lovable. That's all we want. You see, to be loved is a fundamental need of human nature. You can have the prettiest girl in the world at your side. It gets miserable really fast if there is no spark, no chemistry, no passion, no attraction, no mutual respect. If she doesn't endlessly amuse you, if she doesn't adore you, your relationship can only be one of emptiness and loneliness. Every passionate relationship began passionately. As Shakespeare wrote, Whoever loved, that love not at first sight. Falling in love is that euphoric loss of sensibility, that exquisite madness that takes over all our senses. It is a form of madness. Seeing, it's, it's like seeing a miracle that no one else can see. It's like building a hut on an island over there and all your friends are going, what are you doing? You understand, but they don't understand. You can see it, they can't. 
that's what falling in love is like. The feeling described by the greatest Italian poet Dante, he described it. He was the one who wrote the Divine Comedy, and he also wrote a book called La Vita Nuova. In it, he describes first setting eyes on a girl named Beatrice. He would go on to love her for the rest of his life. And here's what he wrote about the first time he saw her. Keep in mind, this is written in the year 1302. He wrote, She was dressed in a very noble color, a delicate crimson, tied with a girdle and trimmed in a manner suitable to her tender age. She was called Beatrice by many who did not know what it meant to call her this. The moment I saw her, I say, in all truth, that the vital spirit, which dwells in the inmost depths of the heart, began to tremble so violently that I felt the vibration alarmingly in all my pulses, even the weakest of them. As it trembled, it uttered these words, Behold a God more powerful than I, who comes to rule over me. That's falling in love. Every passionate relationship began passionate. You know, we spend a fortune hoping to achieve that state of being lovable. We look for it in a, in a pill or a lotion or a gym. Men concentrate on success, on wealth and power. By attaining these things, they believe they can be more lovable. Women concentrate on being more attractive, more desirable physically. It is all for just one thing, for one goal, to make us more lovable to the opposite sex. But no matter what we do, we can't seem to find some measure of acceptance of ourselves and who we are. That fundamental longing in our soul is what has fueled every endeavor of man. There is no question that love, in all its various guises, is the world's most powerful emotion, inspiring, for instance, all the great poems great, incredible works of art. Everything from Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata to the Taj Mahal. Wars have been fought because of love. Knights lived and died by the code of chivalry, that so-called courtly love. Love of the lady, the ideal of her. And you might be thinking, yeah, whatever, Zan. I just want to pick up hot chicks. Easy for you to say, I just want to get laid. I'll take that rich guy's girl, thanks. I'll try and find happiness later. And that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. What you will discover though, is that the better you get with women, the less you need them. The less you need validation for yourself as a man. And the less you need women, the more women you will have. The better you get with women, the less you will feel the need to prove it to other guys. The things you think you've always wanted, are not what you really want at all. The girl you think you want in your life that will create happiness in you is just a girl. I mean that in a good way. I mean that it isn't fair to project that onto her, to demand of her that she makes you happy. It's too much to ask of anyone. That's why our relationships die right and left. You know, you're listening to my talk for a reason. You bought this DVD for a reason. We think it's about women, but this has never been about women. This has never been about other men. This has always been about rediscovering your soul and regaining a former clarity. As you become more centered in yourself, you get a purpose in life that isn't her. Slowly it begins to dawn on you that the answer you seek can never be found in a woman. Well, that's my little discourse on love. I believe in love, guys. I'm a romantic. Love at first sight is in our very nature. We can't help it. It's the way we are built. It is now known that across all cultures, ancient and modern, the South Sea Islands, Japan, China, India, Polynesia, Africa, Canada, love at first sight is a natural human condition. By simply looking at someone for the first time, some feeling at the center of her being can be triggered. Every passionate relationship began passionately. The problem arises when we expect that feeling to last forever and build lifetimes around it. 
So what is love? Well, maybe love is the ability and willingness to allow her to be what she chooses to be for herself. To just be beautiful, to be the beauty, without any insistence that she satisfies you. How do you stay out of the let's just be friends zone? I basically tell her straight out, I'm not that guy. I tell her right off the bat that I'm different than other men she has met. And I also tell her that I'm, I'm one of the most honest men she's ever met. Honest with myself and honest with her. I know who I am and what I like. I tell her I will not lie to her to get her into bed. However, I don't view her as just a friend. I have every intention of taking this further. And if she wants something else, I tell her I have the highest respect for her. And it's too bad because you're cute. We could have had some fun together. I tell her that as I move through this life, I seek to maximize my experiences and the experience of those around me. I tell her that I have no intention of having a non-romantic relationship with her, straight up. If she chooses not to stay, I understand. Not every girl wants the same thing as you. But all of them will say this. They'll say something to the effect of how refreshing it is to hear. And they accept it with no judgment. It is amazing because when you approach a girl with this kind of honesty and directness, there is no such thing as a last minute resistance or wait three months before sex or bitterness or feeling like you deceived her. She knew. And by staying around for one minute longer with you after you told her what she's going to experience, she is complicit in her own seduction. Women love it. All right, so let's imagine for a minute that you have discovered, approached, and attracted into your life the girl of your dreams. The one, if you will. Someone who takes your breath away, and happily, it's reciprocal. She, she really likes you too. The two of you are inseparable, excited by one another, and feel like you've known each other forever. You can't stop thinking about her, and you might even feel that you are in love. And so, you embark on this journey of life together. Now what? How do you manage the relationship? How do you maintain it? The age-old question, how do you keep the love alive? Unfortunately, relationships today, modern relationships, almost always follow the same typical and predictable path. They have a life cycle that repeats itself over and over again. Now I have identified seven distinct stages that I think virtually every relationship goes through. Stage one, they meet and start to date. As the man and woman start to spend more and more time together, they begin to desire exclusivity with each other. They are dating each other, spending a lot of time together, really starting to enjoy each other in stage one. And they both want to move on to stage two. Stage two is the point where a guy and a girl start to refer to each other as boyfriend and girlfriend. They stop seeing other people. And this is either directly agreed upon, let's stop seeing other people. Or it is tacitly agreed and quietly understood. Either way, they are both under the impression that they are exclusive with each other in stage two. Stage three comes along next. This is the stage several months or years down the road when they are completely comfortable with each other. They are, they are happy together. They do a lot of fun and exciting things together. They have wonderful communication, great sex. They go for drinks. They know each other so well. They start to merge their friends, etc. This is that euphoric time when the typical relationship is the most blissful. And they are very, very much in love. Stage three. Stage four comes along. And this is the stage where they settle into the routine of daily life. They are very comfortable with each other and they know each other so very well. They have their ups and downs, of course, the normal vicissitudes of life. They go to their separate jobs, they attend their various classes. She has coffee with her girlfriends, he watches football with his buddies. Normal life. But routine is starting to settle in. In this stage, they start to long for the days of stage three, when they had more time to spend together, when they did fun and exciting things together, before they got bogged down with routine and bills and general life. It seems like their focus is no longer directed in towards them 
and their plans together. There is a quiet unrest that is starting to simmer underneath. This is the stage where they start to say things like, where are we going to be in five years? They start to question what it is they really want. And this is the stage where they say to each other, we need to take more time for each other. Seems like we're too busy to do things together anymore. So they decide to do something like, uh, like have a date night once a week. Stage four. Stage five comes along when they realize that all their best intentions about communicating more, having a date night, etc., are not, not really working. They have the intention, the desire, but daily life gets in the way. And so they both get more and more frustrated. Sex is happening less and less often. And when it does happen, it is dispassionate, unremarkable, uninspired. Now they're starting to resent each other somewhat. And they're surprised that the traits that they really liked in each other at the beginning are now the very things that annoy them the most now. This is the stage where they cast about looking for relief. This is where affairs are usually introduced. Stage five. The next stage, stage six, is where it starts to get a little more nasty. This is where accusations start to fly. At this point, one of them is usually extremely bitter and confrontational, and the other one is becoming more and more apathetic. He or she simply doesn't care anymore. This is a critical stage, stage six. Can the relationship be restored? Good question. Stage seven, make or break time. This is the stage where they separate. They are still technically connected, but taking a break. Everything is drastic and drastic measures are taken. They may try to get back together, but only when one insists they need counseling, etc. They go back and forth, sad and hurt, until they ultimately either end it or shakily get back together and try again. And that is how relationships naturally progress today. That's seven stages. It is so predictable and recurring that it is amazing we are so optimistic going in to begin with. And yet even though we see this happen time and time again in the relationships of people we know as well as our own relationships, we still hope for the best and do it all over again with the next one. We have, of course, in the Tales of King Arthur, the fable of Sir Gawain, renowned by women far and wide for his skill at bluff talking an ill-fated attempt to explain what women desire most, forces King Arthur, under duress, to promise the hand of Sir Gawain in marriage to the loathly Dame Ragnall. Well, that night, the ever-valiant and loyal Gawain leads her to the bridal chamber and when asked, obliges her by kissing her fully and adoringly on her hideous lips he did it as a favor to King Arthur because, and for the kingdom. So he marries this Dame Ragnall, and then in, she's hideous, but he does it anyway, and she asks for a kiss, and he gives it to her. He is then amazed to see her magically transformed into the form of a truly beautiful woman. This is in the evening, and she explains, No, sir, that I have been under an enchantment, forever condemned to form most vile. An enchantment only to be broken when a man was found willing to wed with me with no thought for my ugly form. You have broken the spell. There is, however, another choice you must make, mine husband, for the enchantment to be truly broken. For the rest of your life, you will have to decide if you will have me fair by night for you alone and foul by day, or will you have me foul by night and fair by day for all your friends. The choice is yours. Lady Gawain replied, there is but one answer to be given. The choice must be yours. At which point she cried, husband, you have truly broken the spell. I am now able to fully choose whether to be fair or foul. I choose to be only and always fair for you. For you have given to me what every woman Indeed, husband, every man as well desires most the right to choose for myself who and what I am to be. You know, there's only, when you're with someone, there's only a very short time when you can really give each other things for free with neither of you having to ask. 
Because later on, all you do is make demands of each other. Perhaps the only difference between her and all the rest in the beginning is that she's asking you for nothing. So, how do we do it better? Is there a better way? How do you avoid that dismal mess? It's difficult, but it's all in how you set it up initially. You know, you always hear people say that you have to be happy with yourself before you can be happy with someone else. Well, that's true. But it's also true that experiences in life are amplified once shared. Society has created this cycle that all relationships seem to follow. It has these restrictions of the way it should be on all sides, like a box. It should begin in this way. You need to have uh, these, make these sorts of promises to each other and it needs to be understood or stated that this is forever. We start with a feeling and we head way over there into the future. This is the framework that society expects of us. It is the framework our friends, family, our education, the media expect of us. And invariably, it degrades to what I just described. My take on relationships is this. In my mind, a relationship should never be constructed. It should never be examined, never be analyzed. It should never get to the point where we ask, where are we going to be in five years? It should be pure and beautiful and natural in its own right, without having to be propped up and without having to work on the relationship. It's like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle from physics. It applies to relationships. It states that the moment you attempt to examine something, you change it. In a relationship, as soon as you question where it is going or what the plan is, you change it. And you both need to understand that from the very beginning. If you are with a wonderful girl right now that you adore, never should you say to her, okay, now this is what I expect from you going forward. Or you must be a certain way, forever. Or now you need to behave more like whatever. The only thing you should ever say to her is I had a wonderful time with you today and I want to see you again tomorrow. That's it. And who knows? I think if you can relax in your relationship and just let it flow, only then is it possible for the two of you to be together forever. Only then. You shouldn't analyze it, but you should be amazed by it no matter how long it lasts. That's just me. Others might need a bit more structure and comfort. Uh, one thing is for sure, having to work on a relationship is the death knell of it, as far as I'm concerned. What unfathomable loss of love and freshness, loss of redemption, loss of passion, loss of, of everything I consider to be good is contained in that phrase, work on the relationship. But, you say, relationships are work. They are, after all, a sublime compromise, a, a, a willingness to see ourselves reflected and fulfilled in the desires and dreams of our wonderful companion. This is absolutely correct, and the way it should be. But it doesn't happen very often. Rarely do relationships, traditional relationships, find this equilibrium, this ideal. You know what I mean? We, we talk about how it is a shared responsibility, a 50-50 compromise. And we talk of the need to work out our issues. And then, when faced with the last ragged edge of our discontent, to seek counseling. Wrong! Wrong! I'll tell you the secret of a long-lasting relationship. Me, the seducer. Here's the secret. If you get together with a girl, and you get married or whatever, and you get caught up in the routines of life without examining your soul, your relationship will fail. In other words, if you go to work every day, come home every day, watch the same television shows every day, mow the lawn on the weekend, and then start it all over again the next week, and never seek to become a more excellent person. The notion of self-discovery and improvement, your relationship will fail. If you never explore the beauty of her and seek to understand her, it will fail. If you never listen, really listen to her, it will fail. We think that what is important to, to get ahead, to get a bigger house, to acquire more things, to fill our lives with activities because we don't ever want to be caught doing nothing. We think that's important. If you do this, 
take your kids to soccer, go to a restaurant, have your date night or whatever, and the two of you are not on some kind of spiritual journey together, your relationship will fail. And by spiritual, I mean that in the broadest sense of the term. I mean the two of you are seeking to understand each other and yourselves and your place in this world as best you can. It can only last if the two of you are seeking to become more excellent in life. If you don't do this, your relationship will fail. We all know of couples that have stayed together for many years. A lot of times these couples are not really still in love. They sleepwalk through their lives. They have just given up. They have settled. Dregs settle in your glass of wine. Occasionally, however, you will find a couple that has been together a long time and they are still crazy about each other. It could be your grandparents. It's rare, but it happens. If you ask them about it though, they will always say, it hasn't always been good. There have been times of severe trouble, but we worked through it. We stayed the course and we are better for it today. This is because they have discovered one thing. Love is not a feeling, a pleasant sensation. Love is an art. Love is an art, just like living is an art. And as such, it requires theory, skill, and practice. To a true seducer, a lover of women, relationships never end. Think about that for a second. A true seducer realizes this. He is connected to the women in his life forever. There is no animosity. There are no hard feelings. His relationship with her never ends. Sure, he might not be with her physically throughout her life, but he has touched her so profoundly that she will always carry him around in her heart. How is this possible? How is it that the women he has had relationships with love him forever and are his biggest defenders? Isn't it true that when a relationship ends, it ends badly? Not necessarily. See, a woman is a butterfly that landed on your hand. You must be very still and enjoy it as long as you can before she flies away. You need to recognize that you've been blessed with her presence. You need to delight in that butterfly. And it is very important that you curl your hand up slightly to keep the wind off her. Women want to be protected. They want to rest there for a while, knowing they're safe and knowing they're wanted there. Will she eventually fly away? Possibly. Because people change and grow. People need different things in different stages of their lives. And so you need to keep your hand very still and admire that little butterfly for as long as she stays. And she may stay for the rest of your life. It's up to you, actually. She will stay there as long as you remain fascinated by her. The moment you take your eyes off her and get distracted, she will notice. And if you do this long enough, she will eventually fly away. Most men can't stand the fact that she might fly away someday, and so they attempt to hold her fast. They close their hand around her to keep her at all costs, to restrict her movement so she can barely breathe anymore. This is jealousy, and it will cause her to struggle to get away. A woman must be free to leave. Only then will she stay. You know, women will move in and out of your life. Cherish them when they come in, and cherish them when they go out. I never have bad breakups. I miss every girl I've ever been with. And they will never say a bad word about you, even long after you are no longer a couple, no, long after you're no longer together. How is this possible? Because you gave her room to breathe, to be together apart. You respected her that much. Women will only say, say bad things about you, will only feel disappointed in you, and will only feel cheated if they thought you promised something to them that you didn't deliver. If you promised her forever and you didn't deliver it, she will resent you. If you are honest from the outset about the way that you approach life and loving in relationships, she will never feel cheated if it ends. She will defend you forever because she understands you 
and you didn't lie to her. And the concept of breaking up, what a thought. You know, I'm always struck that in this world of so little caring, it's an unbelievably profound thing to tell someone who loves you, who really cares about you. It would be really sad if you were hurt or hungry or lost to stop caring for you, to go away. Please leave my life. Please stop caring about me. What a thing to do. You know, you will come to a point in your journey when you will realize the following. A woman can come into your life and become your muse and your source of inspiration. A beauty that colors everything you do. Then someday, that same woman may slip away from you. You will both be sad and you will miss each other terribly. But the memory of the beauty she infused into your life will never be overshadowed by the cloud of a deteriorating relationship. And that is a profound and beautiful realization. Once you get to that point in your life when you can gently let go of a beautiful woman, all things are possible with women. And you will have become that honest, loving, desirable seducer that all women secretly admire and crave. You know, a lot of people advocate open relationships, that we are culturally conditioned with unrealistic expectations of monogamy. After all, sex and love are two different things. And we should never allow our strong bond, our relationship, to be destroyed by a simple biological act, our sex drive. Sex is just gymnastics. It shouldn't kill your love for one another. Well, that works great in theory, but it's far more difficult in practice. This is because no matter how enlightened we think we are, most of us experience some modicum of jealousy if our spouse or our lover has a sexual relationship with someone else. I think it is crucial to understand what jealousy is and what it is about. Jealousy is about fear, fear of the unknown and of change, fear of losing power or control in a relationship, fear of scarcity and of loss, fear of abandonment, fear of rejection. We take it as a reflection of our own insecurity about our worthiness, anxiety about being adequate as a lover, and doubts about our own desirability. That's what jealousy is at root. So what is it that bothers us so much when our girlfriend or wife has an affair with someone else? Let's explore that for a moment. Let's imagine you're in a relationship with a wonderful, wonderful girl. You've been together for a few years and let's say you're married. You love each other immensely, but there is no longer any passion in your relationship. You move through your days as if you two are sleepwalking together. You carry your lunch pail to work every day. She goes to her job every day. And in the evening, you watch TV together every day. You hardly sleep together at all anymore. However, she is a wonderful woman and you have some wonderful times together. Sounds pretty normal, right? You know she's not sexually satisfied anymore, but you're so tired after work most of the time and so, and so busy, you just want to go to sleep. It would be okay if she just wanted a quickie, but She's going to want a full treatment tonight, lots of foreplay, etc. And you just don't have the energy tonight for a full production. That's, that's normal. That's what we are normally like. So life goes on and this continues. Imagining this, right? But then one day you notice she hasn't asked you for sex in quite a long time. In fact, now that you think about it, she's being unusually happy these days. Instantly you suspect what? She is having an affair. So you confront her. Of course she's not having an affair, she laughs. No. But then she tells you something. She tells you about this new company in town that offers the opportunity to have a virtual affair. Not interactive computer sex with a real person on the other end of a computer connection, but a simulated environment, a controlled environment, in which you can have sex with a completely simulated person. She tells you it feels exactly like real sex. But in fact, you just lie there on a table, completely still with all your clothes on. 
and all the experiences are caused by computers stimulating your brain to make it seem as though you are ha actually having sex. And it is marvelous sex, she tells you. All the thrills of an affair. But because there's no third person involved, is it really infidelity? How would this make you feel? Would you be jealous? Well, there's two ways to look at it. If we don't mind that she goes to the gym and then hands over to her cyber sex appointment, then that would suggest that the crucial factor of infidelity is the involvement of another person. That's what we don't like, another person there. But if we don't like her having this virtual sex, it bothers us then it would seem that it is not the role of a third party that is the problem after all. What is upsetting us is not that she is turning towards someone else, or in this case, something else. What upsets you is that she is turning away from you. In other words, when she goes out to have her virtual sex appointment, it signals that she has stopped seeing you as the person to which she wants to express herself sexually. This, I think, is, is the whole crux of it. This is what bothers us so much about infidelity. If our girlfriend or wife sleeps with another guy, we tend to get mad at him, when really it has nothing to do with him at all. Why get mad at him? It's not his fault. No one, no one ever steals your woman. She leaves of her own volition. She leaves because she has to. My own personal view of jealousy is this. If that beautiful, wonderful woman that I am with, who I say I respect and adore so much, ever meets a man that she would rather be with than me, then who am I to stop her? What right do I have to impede her happiness? She is not my possession. She has the right to be happy in life. And if she would be happier with someone else, with him, then she should be allowed that freedom. For fun, I always introduce girls to other people as my sister. This includes girls I just met, and even my girlfriend. She's used to it by now. For instance, if uh, my girlfriend and I are together and someone asks, so were you guys together? I usually answer something like, what, us? No, this is my sister. She's kind of cute for a sister. She's totally available too, man. I will totally say stuff like that all the time in front of her. She's used to it. Another thing that's fun to say when my girlfriend and I are asked if we are a couple, I will always answer, no, we're usually a threesome. But the other girl couldn't make it. It's no fun to say that kind of stuff if my girlfriend is not around to hear me say it. That's, that's half the fun. She wants, you want to get her to punch you on the arm. I always say stuff like that when she's around. I also introduce girls I just met as my sister. For instance, I was talking to a girl I just met at a party one time, just met her, and a friend of mine walked up. And he's like, hey, Zan, how you been? Very good, and you? doing good, doing good, and he's glancing over at this girl who I'm talking to, wanting to be introduced, she's extremely hot, and so I'm like, oh, hey, let me introduce you to my sister. And when you say that, you smile and wink at her like it's an inside joke. Let me introduce you to my sister, this is Sylvia. And he's like, your sister, huh? His interest level goes way up. Well, hello, Sylvia. It's fun. I do this all the time. The guy will start to make all kinds of overtures to your sister, and I just sit back and laugh and wink at the girl. She'll talk to him and play along, but of course she wants nothing to do with the guy. This is because what I just did is very similar to a takeaway and is very powerful. Essentially, it cements your status with her in her mind. Or for another example, I'll be sitting in a restaurant with a girl and the waitress will arrive and it'll go something like this. Uh, the waitress will say, hello, my name is Angela and I'll be your waitress for the evening. Can I get you anything to drink? I will immediately say, Hi Angela, I'm Zan, and this is my sister Nicole. I'll have a Perrier with lime. Always have fun with that. The beauty of this is that it completely takes the girl off guard. You do it in a joking way, serious to the person you are introducing her to, the guy or the waitress, but covertly smiling and winking to the girl you're with. They absolutely love it. The thinly veiled implication here is that you are confident enough in yourself to present her to others as your sister. And what's great is they will usually go along with the joke and then laugh and hit you on the arm later. That is the state you want to be in with a girl. It's kind of like James Bond and Moneypenny. He's always flirting with her, 
And she always replies, oh, James, you're incorrigible. That is the rapport you want to create between women and you. Women love it. Try it sometime. It's a lot of fun. We need to accept the ways in which we are different. It's like, it's kind of like we are swimming in the ocean. Some people like to swim near the surface, where it is wonderful and refreshing. Not a care in the world. Near the surface it is light, and there is very little pressure. It is easy to swim fast and have a lot of fun. You can see the sunlight rippling on the surface above, and you know you are very close to the way out. All you have to do is swim up and you're out. It is kind of an easy light green. And some people like to swim deeper in the ocean, where it starts to become more vibrant and rich. There's much more to see here. Wonderful fish and sea creatures and coral and exotic looking plants. Beautiful and vibrant. But there's more pressure. It is a little, little slower going. And if you are this deep, it is not as easy to get to the surface. There's a lot more pressure, but also a far more serene and reflective experience. It is more profound and meaningful. Either way is fine but every person tends to prefer one or the other. You will find that you might like to be deep in the ocean where it is colorful and vibrant, but the woman you're with might not be comfortable so deep. She may like to swim near the surface. Now, if you encourage her, she will come down for a while and swim a little deeper with you because she really does love you. But eventually, she might feel she can't breathe or the pressure is too much for her to bear, and she will have to return to the surface. That's what relationships today are like. People like to swim at different depths, and there's nothing you can do about it. You have to enjoy swimming with that wonderful woman who has come into your life for as long as you can. But you can never change the depth she prefers. Therein lies a lot of our problems in a relationship. And find, finding someone who likes to swim at the same depth as you is not very easy. In fact, you might wish you were more of a surface person. Because it seems so much easier and, and, and you don't have to feel so deeply. But you can't. Or vice versa, you might wish you, were, you could swim deeper, but you need to be near the surface. But this knowledge that we all have different levels that we're comfortable with will free you from the unreasonable expectations you place on her. You, ha you have to let her swim where she is most comfortable and happy. And by doing so, you might lose her as the current drifts you two apart. But if you don't, if you try to force her to stay with you at your chosen depth, you will definitely lose her. Definitely. Another example, uh, Monet, the famous Impressionist painter. He spent the last half of his life painting the same bridge over and over again, at different times of the day, different seasons, over and over again. The same bridge. And as he aged and his eyesight worsened, the paintings get blurrier and blurrier and blurrier. Same bridge, a little bit harder to make out what it is, but it's the same bridge that he always painted. That is traditional modern relationships. We keep entering into the same relationships over and over and over again. We think this one will be different, but it's just the same old bridge painting we've always done. And as time goes on, each relationship we enter into is less carefully painted because we are losing our ability to see. On the other hand, Vermeer, the 16th century Dutch master, he painted amazing scenes of ordinary people in ordinary clothes doing ordinary things. His painting of the lace maker is very famous, and even more famous is uh, the girl with the pearl earring. Very famous paintings. But what everyone agrees that is remarkable about Vermeer's painting, way ahead of his time, is the way he painted light. It is surreal and beautiful. In fact, there are some who say that he really only painted light, not the subjects in his painting. He wanted to show that the light was the important theme of the picture. If there was no light, nothing else in the picture mattered. They were just objects. He didn't see it as a table, but as an object reflecting light back at him. 
That is the enlightened approach to relationships. You don't want to paint your relationships like one A, painting the same thing over and over again and losing clarity and insight in the process. You want to paint your relationships like Vermeer in such a way that the beauty of the light reflected off of it enriches the lives of you and her and everyone else around. Can the art of love be learned? Can we learn to be the kind of man women respond to? Can we learn ways of being that increase our aura, our charm, our confidence, our attractiveness quotient with women? Can you learn to live a life that is purposeful? Can you learn to be compelling? Can you learn how to have a certain joie de vivre that makes you irresistible to women, a man to be admired and desired? Can we actually change? The answer to all these questions is yes. I firmly believe that natural skills, seduction skills, can be learned by almost anyone. I have seen quiet, even shy men become charismatic and effective, enlightened seducers, naturals, and leaders of men. Here's a question for you. Have you ever been a woman's fantasy? What a thought. Think about it. Have you ever been a woman's fantasy? How would it make you feel if you knew that somewhere a woman was fantasizing, dreamily dreaming about you right now? Women are fantasizing about someone, why not you? Can one learn to become a natural? We talked about this, we have all seen what we generally call naturals. We have known guys that are good with women. And as we have seen, they aren't born with it. Every man that is naturally good with women is that way because he made a conscious effort to be that way. He studied it, he learned it. That guy you all know who was a natural became a natural because he took from his experiences what worked and discarded what didn't work. He sought to improve and he thought about his attitudes and methods and his mindset very directly and very diligently. Was I always good with women? Did I always have a great self-confidence? Well, let me tell you a little bit about my background. I was beat up and picked on as a kid in school. My clothes were hand-me-downs from my brother and I was definitely not cool. I was not a cool kid in school. When they were picking kids for the team, for instance, I was always the last one picked. You know how it goes. Billy, Joey, Jason, Jimmy in the wheelchair, uh, Zan, I guess. It's kind of like that. In short, I had zero confidence growing up all through school. Zero. I was a quiet, shy kid, a bookworm. So here, here I was, this scared, extremely shy, awkward little kid, and I remember in the third grade falling in love with a girl in my class. Her name was Judy and I was smitten, I remember. I couldn't take my eyes off her. She was so perfect in my eyes, I was so quiet and shy. Long golden hair. I can still remember sitting on the swing next to her and getting up my nerve to finally talk to a girl, her. When I finally did find my voice, I squeaked out something along the lines of, uh, I like you. And she gave me what I think must have been my very first, not my last, let's just be friends speech. I spent the rest of the year in school watching this girl quietly and thinking about her. And she spent the rest of the year being the pretty popular girl in class and virtually ignoring my very existence. Every year of school after that, I repeated the pattern. I would always fall for the popular pretty girl in my class and she would always freeze me out of her life. Not that it took very much effort on her part, I was mostly too scared or shy to approach her anyway. On any level, I had no confidence and never once did I believe that I deserved a girl like her. That she could ever want anything to do with someone like me. So I consistently rejected myself on her behalf and saved her the trouble of even having to acknowledge me. So I was 
not good at sports. I was kind of shy and awkward. What was I good at? Well, I was good at chess. I was captain of the chess club. I was a computer nerd. I still am. I still am a computer nerd. So this went all the way like that to my senior year of high school. The last year of high school, I scraped up the nerve to ask a girl to the senior prom. Now bear in mind, this is the first time I had approached the girl in any way since the girl on the swing years ago. Well, guess what happened? I spent weeks getting my nerve up and I finally said to her, uh, will you go to the dance with me? And she replied, why Zan, of course I won't. That's right, she said no. Oh, did she already have a date? Didn't want to hurt that guy's feelings by going with me instead? Uh -uh. She had no plans yet but simply did not want to go with me, with me. That affected me greatly. And as I continued on in life after school, I carried with me the same limiting beliefs that I didn't deserve a girl like her. Until one day I decided to change. I decided to become a student of women. I had no uh, experience with women whatsoever, and I decided to become a student of women. I set out to change the way I related to women and the way they related to me. I became a student in the same way that I had learned the Queen's Gambit opener in chess. I started to study and attempted to learn the ways of women, and I am still learning. A unique mix of personality characteristics that we call charm is what attracts a woman. This is what makes them listen to us in the first place. This is what makes them believe what we are saying and, and want to get to know us. Charm describes many character traits like communication skills, a compelling purpose in life, an unfailing belief in oneself, to name a few. We have all heard the phrase, fake it until you make it. Well, what exactly does that mean? At first blush, it seems to mean that if you do not have the requisite attitude or skill set for something, do it anyway and fake that you have it. Eventually, you will make it or eventually you will have it. Does this work? Yes, it does. But not for the reason you might at first think. It isn't because by faking it, you will eventually become something different than you are and that you are moving toward the notion of making it. Rather, the very notion of you taking steps to do something out of character or out of your comfort zone is not faking it. It is actually the first step of making it. By taking the first step of change, you have already become what you seek to be. There is no fake it until you make it. There is only making it. For every step you take towards that betterment is making it. You know, we are like actors. At first, unsure of, of the lines, then steadily more inhabiting our parts part of ourselves showing through, partly someone else. More and more, we are able to immerse into this other persona until there is very little of us left. In fact, eventually, we convince ourselves that this is the new us, the old us was the real actor. It's kind of like those uh, magic eye posters. You ever see those posters, those ones that look like a bunch of random colors and patterns? You know the ones. You look at it, it's just a bunch of random colors and patterns, but once you get how to look at it differently, how you kind of look through it, a little cross-eyed even. Suddenly you can see the image hidden inside the picture. It's in there floating away. Understanding women is sort of like that. You don't get it at first. You can't see it. I, I can't see it. I don't get it. But then, almost without explanation, you just do. Suddenly you do. All of a sudden you see it. You understand and you can never look at it the same way again. Someone said to me recently that surely there must be a distinction between those who have learned to be charismatic and charming and those who were just born with it. That one is real and the other will always be fake. A close approximation, but fake. Well, let's look at it this way. Let's say you worked at 7-Eleven. I come in to buy some candy and I hand you a dollar bill. So far, a pretty normal everyday transaction, right? But let's say the dollar bill I handed to you was one that I drew with crayons on a napkin. You, as a 7-Eleven clerk, would most likely be astute enough to inform me to get out of the store, that you don't take fake dollar bills. So I go away, and I come back a month later with a dollar bill that I photocopied on a color photocopier. You look at it very carefully, 
and hold it up to the light, it appears genuine, but still you aren't sure. So you put it in the little ultraviolet light checker thingy and it glows. It glows wrong. You are now sure that this dollar bill is counterfeit and once again, you kick me out of the store, threatening to call the police. Undeterred, I go back to my basement lab. But this time, I managed to create a perfect replica of a dollar bill. Not one that just looks and feels exactly like a dollar bill, but one that is molecule for molecule, identical to a real dollar bill. The paper is exactly the same as the paper is a real dollar bill. The ink is exactly like the ink of a real dollar bill. All of the little security strips, the color shifting ink, the hologram elements, exactly the same. This time, it passes all the tests that you, the 7-Eleven clerk, throw at it. You know I have tried to pass off phony bills before, so you are especially diligent. But after careful scrutiny, you are satisfied that this is indeed a real dollar bill. So you give me my change, and I walk out with my candy. So now here's the question. Was this a real dollar bill or not? If it is exactly like a real dollar bill, but it's fake, but right down the molecular level, it is real, seems real, then what distinguishes it from a real dollar bill? Surely it must be real. What is the difference between my homemade bill and a real one? Well, when you think of it, since they are molecularly the same, the only difference is the provenance, where they came from, the source. In other words, mine was made by me in my basement. The real one was made by the government. So the only difference between the two bills is their history, where they came from. Functionally, they are the same. They both can be used interchangeably. They are both real. The lesson from this is that the source is the only real determinant of what is real and what is fake. So if a man has been a natural with women since his early teens, who is to say he is more real or more natural than a man who learned it in his late 20s or 30s or 40s? What can we gather from this? One, there's no such thing as fake it until you make it. And two, yes, all of this can be learned. I learned it, others have learned it. There is no one who is born a natural, they're all invented. They have all created themselves. The logical conclusion can only be this. We can all learn to be the way we desire to be, including you. If we assume then that those first two principles are fundamentally true, then at what point can we say that someone is now good with women? If we look at a man in a given point of time over there, he is no good with women. He is by all accounts unskilled. But let's say he begins to approach women. He gets a phone number. He slowly gets better and better. At what point would we say he is a natural? At what point would we watch him in action and say that he is truly a natural? Now he's good with women. Well, let's go back to another dollar bill example to see if we can get an answer. Let's say you encounter a homeless man on the street. He has no food, no money, and no home. His only possession is a tin can that he has placed in front of him on the sidewalk. He is what we would all call monetarily poor. Sure, he might be rich in his heart, be happy and serene in the sunlight and all that, but by the measurement of financial wealth, there is no one that would say that he is rich. He has nothing but a tin can. But let's say you go up to him and you give him a dollar bill. Is he now rich? Well, one could argue that he is relatively rich compared to what he used to have, which is nothing. But in the context of the wealth of the city around him, no one would, would walk by and think, wow, that guy is rich. But what about if you gave him a second dollar bill? Now is two. Is he now rich? Well, he's twice as wealthy as he was before, but again, no one would mistake him for a millionaire, for a rich guy, having only two dollars to his name. But let's continue. What if you gave him another dollar, and then another dollar, and then another dollar? What if you kept giving him dollar bills? At what point then would we say that that guy is rich? Perhaps you might say that he is rich, and I would agree, when he has been given his millionth dollar. Correct? But then, what if you took a dollar away from him and he is left with $999,999? Is he still rich? What is the cutoff? The truth is there is no magic point, no distinction between rich and poor. Whatever number you decide is the point that you would call him rich. I will then ask, what will he be if you remove $1 from his tin can? Will he still be rich?
That is the third important principle. You are never truly accomplished, never truly rich. You will never truly be satisfied with your skills with women. The principles of a natural enlightened seduction have remained the same forever. It has always worked. In all times and places, there have always been men who know how to be comfortable around women. It is like mathematics. Society changes all around. But the basic principles of men who have women in their life does not. Like my 10 traits I outlined earlier in this program, they never change and they never will change. I always wondered why the orchestra has never added a new type of instrument since forever. Why in school did they hand out trumpets and tubas and not something different and new? Since the invention of the saxophone in the 1800s, no new musical instrument has found their place in the modern orchestra. The amplified plucked string and electronic keyboard instruments have introduced new sounds and greatly increased volume in certain forms of music. But the principles of generating musical notes is still the same as it ever was. We either pluck or bang on something that is stretched, or we blow through a hole. That's it, two ways. And taken even further, those two can be broken down into this. It all comes down to vibration. So if the principles of seduction and success with women have never changed, just like music, then why is it so hard to learn and assimilate? Many men come to believe that their lives are only a compilation of psychological wounds that they feel they can do little to heal. They project their past experience with women onto every woman that comes into their lives. Now, although the state of mind is sad, self-limiting and defeating, it can be very comfortable. It is easier. It gives them permission to lead a life of limited responsibility for themselves. It gives you an excuse. So as the years go by, and a man becomes accustomed to this kind of self-protection, it is more and more difficult to change. So when you find yourself saying or thinking, I think I could be great with women if only my circumstances or my looks or my wounded past didn't prevent me from achieving it, then take steps to change that poisonous mindset. If you don't have a girlfriend, but you want one, I'll tell you why you don't have one. You don't have a girlfriend because you don't really want one. If you really wanted a girlfriend, if you really wanted success with women, you would have. But understand where it comes from. It comes from in here. Now what compelled you to watch this program? What is it that you hope to gain? Most importantly, what do you really want from women? Most men, when asked, can't answer that question. There are some men who think they know exactly what they want, but if they somehow manage to get it, they realize it isn't really what they wanted after all. And compounding your answer is what you desire from women changes as your experience with them grows. It is a well-known phenomenon that winning the lottery generally does not make people fundamentally happier than they were before, just like getting that woman that you've always desired. For a short time, short time yes. They seem to be on top of the world. I won the lottery. But after a time, the people who are happy in life, who had a zest for living, who are pleasant to be around, are still the same way after they win the lottery. The only difference is that they have a million dollars. Conversely, if you are a miserable pessimist who hates the world for letting you down, you are going to be a rich, miserable pessimist. So ask yourself, what is it you want from these creatures we call women? How do you want to be perceived by them? It's essential to understand where you feel you are today and where you wish to be tomorrow. Now I automatically have a lot, a, a massive respect for everyone watching this program and here's why. I approach life like I am on a type of journey, a quest. And you also are a seeker or you would not be watching this. We are all on a journey. There are a lot of guys who desire to learn more about themselves, who, who wish to be more dynamic in their interaction with women, to maximize excellence in their lives, and yet they are too proud, they are too proud to admit it. Too proud to admit that they might be able to gain something. And so they go on through their lives in misery. But always remember this, you're a seeker, but the answer you seek can never be found in a woman. 
Inevitably, as men get better with women, as they get more comfortable being in their presence, they start to realize that the things they thought they wanted, they don't really want. The women they idolized leave them empty. Think how many rock stars and movie stars who wanted so, so bad to make it, to get fame and fortune. Why did they want it? To get women. To get the validation of women mainly. And yet, why do so many of them turn to drugs, alcohol, to release? Because they realize that the moment they can get any woman they desire, the moment they can buy anything they wish, it loses its appeal. When you have enough money to buy five Ferraris, it loses its luster. And similarly, when you can walk into a room, a club, or a party, and because of your fame or your money, you can have sex with any woman there, you suddenly don't really want to. And if you do, it's just release. You were just horny and she was nearby. And you knew she would not say no because of who you are. Bruce Willis said this, Becoming famous was amazing and fun for about a month. You know, when I talk about visualizing the future you, it might sound like a lot of, um, sounds very nebulous, like kind of new agey nonsense, but it isn't. It is the fundamentals of all success. And you're thinking, okay, I just want to pick up girls. And I understand that. There is no quick fix. There is no three magic words that are going to make that girl fall for you. But you will be swamped with offers for that. It isn't that. It's a mindset change. It is a, it is a way of looking at your future and your life and yourself in a different way. So that it is very much what I'm talking about. Now, the whole concept of visualization, let me explain what I mean by that. We can spend 30 minutes watching a sitcom and that 30 minutes goes by and yet we can't spend 30 minutes sitting quietly by ourselves. And when you think about it, in this day and age, in, in, in our modern society, we fill our time in our lives with activity. We have to. We have frenetic lifestyles. If we have free evenings during the week, well, we sign up for classes, we sign up for something, we do something, we join volleyball, we do whatever we have to do so that we're not idle. Because we think if we sit quietly by ourselves, we're not doing anything and that's wrong. You know, in North America, we, uh, we live to work. When somebody asks you about you, who you tell me about you, the first thing we say is we describe what we do because that's our whole identity. But in reality, in other places of the, on, of the world, they work to live. They enjoy life. They have a glass of wine, sit on the balcony. That's what they want to do. And we don't have that mindset so much here. And the problem is we can't be what we think is idle. But the truth is 30 minutes sitting by yourself, contemplating your place in the universe and contemplating what you want your future to be like, instead of that 30 minutes with a sitcom, you could sacrifice that for this. Sitting quietly is the highest form of activity you can do. It is the key to correcting all the imbalances in your life and going forward. So remember that when you are trying to, when you are trying to think about, okay, how do I visualize? This is what I'm saying. Find a quiet place, sit quietly by yourself, close your eyes and picture you the way you would see yourself. You have to see it with emotion. You have to feel it. You have to, as your eyes are closed, you have to feel that you are actually there, that person. How you would feel, how would it make you feel? If you do that, if you do that once a day, sacrifice your sitcom, it, it, immense things will happen in your life because you are focusing on that. What you focus on is where your life goes. I'm going to tell you now the single most effective way of changing your life and your success with women. Your success in everything. This is the most important thing you can learn here today. Simply stated, picture yourself 90 days from now. Picture the ideal you 90 days from now. Where would you like to be and how would you like to be? Picture it very clearly. What would you wear? How would you talk? How would you stand? How would you walk? How would you interact with women? Where would you be? 
Picture it very clearly, vividly. Imagine how it will make you feel 90 days from now. Hold it in your mind for a minute. Now from this moment on, erase everything from your life that doesn't look like that. You know, we are told to write down one-year goals, five-year goals, etc. Forget all that. It's hard to maintain that kind of dedication and focus. That's why we fail so spectacularly at all our goals and New Year's resolutions. Instead, use 90 days. That's all you have to do, 90 days. Picture what you would like to have in your life in 90 days. Then head toward it, no matter what. Does that TV show look like your future you? No? Get rid of it. Stop watching depressing news shows that add nothing to your life. In fact, stop watching TV. There is no better way to make your life more interesting than to stop watching TV and to do something else. What you think about and fill your mind with is what attracts to your life. Success with women, as with anything, is not an accident. It is a choice. It is deciding exactly how you want the world around you to be and what it will look like 90 days from now. So do these three simple things. Here they are. Number one, write down in a list everything you desire, no matter what it is. Number two, read that list three times a day without fail. And think about it constantly. No matter what you're doing, think about the things on your list. That's what you really desire all day long. And three, don't tell anyone else what you're doing. Don't tell anybody about your list. That's it. You have no idea how these things are going to happen in your life. But just trust that they will, somehow. You know, we wish for things to materialize in our life, but we don't really believe we deserve them. We doubt that we deserve them. The problem is that we wish for things, but we don't want them bad enough. The truth is, we would rather watch TV or play our video games than have a girlfriend if we don't want it bad enough. Or you'd have it. The key is the clarity of your vision. You have to think of how you want to be and think of nothing else. Concentrate on the things you want and cast out the things you don't want. Whatever reality you create inside you will create the reality outside of you. Now you might have no clue how the universe will align with your internal vision, but it will. If you continually visualize what you want to happen in your life vividly, it will happen. If you continue to think about your, your problems, your bills, your debt, your lack of success with women, your circumstances, well, that will happen too. Whatever you dwell upon is what will happen in your life. You see, the average person makes goals, writes them down, makes resolutions, then they start to think about what about this and what about that. It's our habit. We have been doing it for years. And so you give your mind conflicting mental images back and forth. That is why you can read a motivational book and get all excited. And several days later, your old habits come creeping back in and you find yourself lying around watching TV again. It has been well said that the size of your problems is the size of your life. That means if your biggest problem is how to get a date or how to pay your cable bill, then that is as large as your life will get. That's the size of your problems. However, if your biggest problem is whether to marry a lingerie model or a bikini model, then that is how big your life will get. That's your biggest problem, that's how the size of your life. So no matter what is going on around you, think about your goals. Erase everything that does not look like your vision of the future. You have to see it clearly. You have to feel the emotion associated with it and for as long as you can. You know, in your attempt to change, to motivate yourself, what we always try to do is motivate our mind. But you have to motivate your emotions. A good way of doing this is doing daily affirmations. You know, it sounds cliche, but believe me, it works. Two that I've used for many years are these. Number one, everything and everyone prospers me now. I say that a lot. Everything and everyone prospers me now. That means no matter who I meet or what situation happens to me in some way, it is creating value for my future. That person or the, the event is valuable to me. Everything and everyone prospers me now. Say that to yourself. It's a daily affirmation. And the other thing I say all the time, in the morning, Morning is a promise. Morning is this. I wake up in the morning and I, and I say to myself, 
everything I desire, my entire future, everything I desire for my future is contained in this day, this morning, this day. That's the other affirmation I say. Your entire future is contained in this day. So that's a very powerful tool. As I said, it sounds cliched, but there's a reason you hear about it all the time. Affirmations, they absolutely work. So stop watching and sipping TV shows and talk shows. Stop hanging around people who bring you down. Stop reading magazines and books that have nothing to do with the way you picture the future you. Is this hard to do? Yeah. That's why most men will never have the success they desire with women. It's easier just to relax. It's easier to settle into our old ways. We find it more comfortable and familiar to sit around wishing for a woman than it is to take the steps to try and get close to one. Successful men never think about failure. When it creeps up on them, they shut it out. Successful men with women never think about rejection from a woman. Do they get rejected? Of course. But they force any negativity out of their mind. Now this is, I'm not talking about positive thinking. Sometimes it's hard to think positively. There are days when it will be very hard to replace your negative thoughts with positive ones. This can be expected, but the answer is to just break out your little list, the one that you were to read three times a day, and read it again. And head towards the things that are on that list. You know, I used to say that you can't control your circumstances. All you can control is your attitude toward your circumstances. In fact, I read that very saying on a motivational poster one time. I used to believe it. I used to believe that your attitude is all you can control. I don't believe that anymore. You can control your circumstances. The world will arrange itself to align with your vision of the way you want it to be, either positively or negatively. Where you look, that is where you will go. There's a story of a young man who wanted wisdom and he went to a master and he said, listen, I want to have the wisdom of the ages. I want to have wisdom, the kind of wisdom you have. And the master said, how badly do you want this? The young man said, more than anything I can imagine. And the old man said to him, okay, come with me. And he takes him down to the river and he tells the young man to look in the river. And so the young man gets down on his knees and he looks and he sees his reflection and he's thinking, okay, um, uh, you're teaching me something about wisdom here. I don't know what it is, but oh. I'll go along. And the old man says, and what do you see? He's, and the young man says, I see my reflection. As the moment he said that, the old man grabbed him by the back of the head and he pushes his head under the water. And the young man's under there holding his breath and he's thinking, okay, he's teaching me something about wisdom here, but I don't know what it is, but uh, well, I'll go along with it. So he holds his breath. But that continues. And all of a sudden he notices that the old man is not letting him up at all and he's starting to run out of breath, so he starts to struggle a bit but the old man does not relent. And so the young man really starts to struggle and really starts to thrash around. He's running out of breath and he's getting scared. He's getting nervous. The old man does not let him up at all. And then he gets really upset. He's really thrashing around. He's about to black out. He's losing all his breath. He's about to pass out. At that moment, the old man pulls him back out of the water. The young man says, sputtering away, he says, what was that about? What, what does that have to do with wisdom? Why did you do that? The old man said to him, when you were under the water, what was the one thing you wanted more than anything else? The young man said, to breathe. And the old master said to him, that's how bad you have to want wisdom. So that's how bad you have to want success. You have to want it that bad. It can't be a wish. You want the magic pickup line? The, the three magic words that will get any woman to fall in love with you? No such thing. It's all a simple choice. You can begin right now by deciding that you're going to think about nothing else but this future picture of you. Do you know where all the greatest books that have ever been written are? Where the greatest ideas are? All the greatest inventions are? I'll tell you where they are. They're in a graveyard. You know, speaking about the brevity of life, I'm reminded of a quote uh, from Beckett's play, Waiting for Godot, talking about women. He said this, They give birth astride a grave. The light gleams but an instant. Then it's darkness once more. Another quote that I like as well is uh, George Bernard Shaw. He said this, This is the true joy of life. 
that being used up for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish little clot of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. My conclusion can only be this. We all want to know that when we are old and about to return to the oblivion that birthed us, we might have at least once in our lives experienced a small measure of beauty that we can hold on to in our memory as we drift away. A memory to savor in the void. A singular instance of definitiveness in a universe of uncertainty. And then, perhaps, our lives would not have been all in vain. Okay, so if eye contact is so important, what are some of the practical things that you can do to enhance it and ensure you are doing it correctly? First, understand that a woman assesses you immediately. You know the old saying, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. Well, it's true. So it is very important to carry yourself and present yourself optimally all the time. And your eye contact, or lack thereof, will tell her volumes about you. Like it or not, she is going to judge you on the way you walk and approach her, on the way you stand when you arrive, and the way you talk to her. And even more importantly, the way you look at her. That's very important. She will immediately attempt to ascertain every facet of your personality from your appearance, your posture, and the way you move. In fact, within 30 seconds, a woman will pretty much feel she has a handle on your entire past, present, and future, all from her first impression. That's how important it is. And a huge part of this first impression is the ease in which you, the enlightened seducer, look into her eyes. For a great example of eye contact, watch Mickey Rourke in the movie Nine and a Half Weeks. When he first encounters Kim Basinger, she is shopping for scarves, looking down at a table. He approaches from the side, and he says something to her, and when she looks up at him, he looks directly into her eyes. It's great eye contact that he gives her. But further, and this is what separates the great seducers from the average guy, when she's looking at this guy, who is this guy, and she's attempting to look back down at the table, he follows her eyes. He stays locked on. He actually moves his head to keep giving her eye contact. It is very seductive and very subtle. He wasn't glaring at her, just nice, easy eye contact. It's a great example. Rent it and see what I mean. It's very subtle. So here's how to understand a little bit about eye contact and how to read hers. When we first meet someone, another guy for instance, we get introduced, we tend to shift our eyes around without really giving good eye contact at all. So in other words, we will, we'll, you know, hi, how you doing? And, and we'll look around the room and we'll glance back at him and we vaguely give eye contact. That's general how you do an eye contact. Then in situations where we concentrate on maintaining eye contact, like like at a job interview, for instance, where we're trying really hard to maintain eye contact, we kind of shift our gaze from eye to eye, back and forth. So we go left to right, left to right. This is disinterested, polite eye contact. We're trying hard to maintain eye contact, but we're not really connected with that person in any way. So that's another way that we do eye contact. When we are having a heart to heart with a friend, we tend to expand that range, that eye to eye range that I'm talking about, to include the nose and the mouth. Kind of, like a, kind of like a triangle. So we, we look at both eyes and we look at the nose and look at the mouth and, and this is you know, a friend of ours, an acquaintance. Then when we encounter a girl we like and we begin to flirt, we do something different. We tend to expand our gaze to include more of their face and even parts of their body. But we always return back to the eyes. And as we warm up to each other and as we feel there is somewhat of a, a connection, we start to feel uh, a little bit of chemistry, you will notice, and she will notice, that we start to gaze more intently into each other's eyes. Another thing we, we do is when we start to get uh, attracted to somebody and we're having a good rapport, 
is we tend to watch their lips a lot more when they're talking, more than we would say the lips of our boss. So we take in a bit more, but we always go back to the eyes and we watch the mouth. So here's something you can, you can do practically. If you notice she is watching you and watching your mouth as you speak at a date or something like that, that can be a very good sign. She might be wondering what it would be like to kiss you. And if a girl starts to do this to you, you will find yourself drawn to her, attracted to her, in spite of yourself. Here's another sign. So watch for that. And here's another sign. Scientists tell us that one of the universal signs of attraction common to every culture on earth is the eyebrow flash. It's, it's momentarily, we never notice it, but we unconsciously raise and lower our eyebrows when we encounter someone that we find attractive. If they are similarly attracted, they do the same. We're not aware that we do that, but it is universal. It's a universal code of recognition of someone that's attractive to us. So keep an eye out for this sign. In fact, it probably wouldn't hurt to try and enhance it by doing it consciously. Hold your uh, eyebrows up for just a second or so upon first meeting her. And I'll give you another example, another Mickey Rourke movie, Angel Heart. He does a perfect example of what I'm talking about right here. Um, he's, he's a detective and he's, um, he's, he's going to this uh, hospital and he goes up to the reception counter and there's a nurse who's busy over there doing her, you know, uh, filing or whatever, uh, receptionist, and he walks up and he's going to ask her a question and he's leaning on the counter and he says, excuse me, she turns around and, and walks up to him and she's like, can I help you? Like this. And as he's walking up, he notices her and she's pretty and he kind of does a little bit of a double take. Not really, but the, it's subtle, you have to watch it, but he kind of goes, ooh, almost like that. His eyebrows flash. And he gives her one of these looks where he notices her. It's very subtle and she immediately changes her whole demeanor from this person, yeah, chewing her gum, can I help you, to doing this and like this and like women will do. It, he just let her know that, um, that he just noticed her just now. So that's another example. Check, check it out. Another thing that is impossible to fake, another good sign that she likes you, and you can watch for this because you can't fake it, is her pupil size. Invariably, the more she finds you attractive and the greater the degree of chemistry, the larger her pupils, or yours, will become. You can't fake it. So if you see her across the table in a restaurant on a date and her pupil size uh, is very large, you can be sure that she's very interested in what you have to say and very attracted to you. Another thing is her blink rate. Her blink rate will tend to go up somewhat. So you could artificially increase your blink rate to make her more likely to reciprocate to, to get that kind of attraction maybe starting to roll. So the next time you're on a date, calibrate her level of attraction to you by where she's looking, she's looking at your mouth for instance, how fast she is blinking, and the size of her pupils. Now hopefully, if you have given off the right eye contact signals, she will come across as love struck.